I met a gypsy. Ryan Hughes, my boy. <laughs> What's happening, my bud? Uh, look, man, I need you got, to you say... Got a head rush? You got a head rush right now from being upside down? No, yeah, sorry. yeah, no, we're uh, we're all crossed up over here, dude. But I got got me coffee, so we're uh, we're sweet. Hey, um, I got to give you yeah, nice. a massive. Oh, actually, before we get too far into it, can you just pull this mic <clears throat> real close to your face? Is that good? Yeah. So yeah, you can pull it to wherever you want to see. Know, you know, it, so. you know, I don't like things this shaped that close to my face. So well, for three hours, mate, we're gonna have to put all that aside. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I got to give you got to give you a big shout out, man, because uh, you don't own a computer. You don't have Wi-Fi, and the implications of that is I now have a U.S. studio for Gypsy Tales, and uh, you're the first guest inside <laughs> uh, the studio. And because of you, uh, you've started us on a bit of a journey, and uh, we now have some pretty cool plans. We got a bunch of stuff in the works. So thank you for not having Wi-Fi. Thank you for not having a computer, because this is a really cool deal. Well, sometimes we got to be pushed. Sometimes we have to, uh, I guess, get out of our comfort zones or somebody has to push us that we don't want to push us in some way. And then that opens up doors. It opens up different ways. You know, there's so many times in my life that that's happened. And even racing, you know, sometimes you get pushed outside and you're like, oh, shit, man, check that line out. Right. And so <clears throat> sometimes we need those things to open up some new, some new ways, some new directions. And uh, so if my easy living, if my uh, simplicity of mindset can bring that to you, then there you go, my friend. I yeah, scratch no, your back, you scratch mine. I really appreciate it, mate. Um, dude, do you remember, you probably <clears throat> don't, I, I literally had this thought in the shower. We met in 2008. <laughs> oh, boy. 2008, yeah. dude, Oceana yeah, 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 Championships. Yeah. You remember when you come to Australia to race okay. that? You're on a Suzuki yeah, yeah. 450, oh, I'm yeah. pretty sure. Yeah, yep. I was working for a magazine at the yep. time. You were probably the first international pro I ever met now that I think of it. Really? Yeah. Wow, well, hopefully I left a good impression. But yeah, that was uh, that year I was racing the, the works races and I was leading the championship and <clears throat> this is kind of how I work. I was leading the championship in the middle of the season, the middle of the race, I just pulled off. I was having problems with my elbow because I broke my humerus the, the year before and... Um, and so I was having problems, but it was hurting, but that wasn't the deal. So I just pulled off in the middle of the se- middle of the race, middle of the season, leading the championship. And I said, I quit. And they're like, what do you mean? You quit? Is your elbow hurting? I said, no, no, no. I quit racing. And I go, you quit racing? What are you talking about? I go, I'm done. I'm over it. I can't do this anymore. I'm having no fun in it. The worst days of my life is being at the track right now. <clears throat> so I, I quit, you know, took some time off. And then the guy, I forget the guy in Australia called me. And he's like, hey, we have this international race. It's New Zealand against Australia, but we want to bring an American over. Would you be interested? I'm like, shit, yeah. So he goes, all right, I got you a business class ticket. So then I told my, my wife at the time, um, yeah, cool, man. I got a business class ticket, this and this and this. And she's like, well, we can't go? I'm like, oh, okay, hold on. So I called him. I said, hey, give me four coach tickets instead of a business class ticket because they're about the same price. So I get on the plane. <clears throat> I walk by the business class tickets where I would have been all the way to the last fucking row of the airplane, yeah. you know, we're sitting. So that's how it went. But then we went there and we just had the most amazing time. My kids had the most amazing time. We got to go down to Bell's beach, right? Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Down there. Yep. Down there. And then all these things and the track, the track was amazing. You know, the track was so good. So had a fun time with the race. The people, um, <clears throat> did a school, I think the day after that, which was fun to be able to teach people. And then we went to the Australian motocross awards yeah. and, um, yeah, had a good time. Chad Reed and Ellie and all those guys were there. I remember I got kicked out of the one bar and then, um, yeah. So Australia, yeah, we had fun. <laughs> yeah, no, that literally just, just come to me today. And I was like, man, Rhino was probably like the first international pro I ever met. So, um, so we you, just, we just met in the pits. Oh yeah. We were, yeah, we, um, yeah, I think we met just like in the in the pits there, and I was working for a magazine at the time. Um, but yeah, honestly, I can't really remember too much a, okay. about it. I remember, um, yeah, I remember you're on the Suzuki. The track was pretty sick. There was like Cooper, Daryl Hurley, uh, maybe Coppins was there. Yeah. You were there. Um, yeah, Cop- I, Coppins. Yeah, Coppins, Hurlings. Yeah, Hurley. Yeah, it's good times. Yeah. So you've pretty much become motocross's spirit animal over these last few years it seems like every everybody seriously loves 
Ryan Hughes these days, and you've you've had such a a massive impact on the sport post racing, and it's probably almost what you'll be remembered for. I think is like this legacy that you're creating. You're this guy that really you stand alone in a lot of your philosophies and the way that you live. Um, you're a super eccentric dude, but in the best possible way. What's it? What's kind of uh, <clears throat> I guess generated this over the last sort of few years. Well, I guess you know it's always been in me, as you know, because it's not like you yeah. know, all of a sudden you just get a new DNA makeup. You you, you know, it's not mm-hmm. like somebody who changes. Well, that's been in there, and that's just been growing in them. It's just been covered up by something that's been suffocated. So there takes times just like this thing, you're going down this journey of opening up a studio here, which will help you probably be able to interview a lot more people. So things happen in my life that open me up to be able to find out this new side of me or what was actually just growing inside Uncov- that yeah. wasn't able to kind of pop, kind of pop yeah. through the dirt, right? Yeah. To be seen. And yeah, there's some weeds, there's some fucking weeds, you know, but there's a lot of flowers. And so that's cool. And, and so I guess it's just a type of person I am, because again, like I've explained people, I didn't go to, I never went to high school. You know, I never stepped foot in high school, so I don't really have that that conditioning. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Of being in a, a school system for so long, and school teaches you what to think. It doesn't mm. teach you how to think. Okay. Now, my schooling was going around the world, racing and traveling the world, and traveling everything, and meeting people, and being in certain situations that I had to uh, kind of figure out myself at being a young age, and mm. that teaches you how to think. Okay. So I'll take that intelligence over knowledge because knowledge is just borrowed so you're going to school you're just borrowing knowledge you travel the world and you go on your own and you got to figure out these new things new look uh, new languages and monies and things like that um <clears throat> it starts to make you very intelligent because you're mm. experiencing something so that's one thing my mind is very logical you know there's no fluff to it there's no there's no bullshit to it it's logical it's if it's not true then it's not it's not right uh, the other thing that doesn't have an ego behind it i'm not trying to be better than anybody yeah, I'm, I'm fucking confident with what I say and what I stand behind, but I'm not trying to be better anybody or am I trying to manipulate anybody or am I trying to lie to mm. anybody? And then my mind doesn't have a dollar sign behind it. Yes, this, that is my weakness in my lifestyle because I could probably be making a shitload more money, but it doesn't matter to me. I just love to share. I love to be able to teach people and be able to give these experiences that I have. Okay, so most people's mindsets are a little bit different than that. And so that's one way that some people maybe see that I'm very eccentric but I don't really feel that I am, you know, I eat probably the same foods everybody else does. I, I go to bed at the same times, you know, and, you know, I just have a little different lifestyle with uh, how I, I live and take care of myself. And then I guess the, the, the final point is um, <clears throat> I want to be hated or I want to be loved because mm. I, I love to fucking fight and I love to love people, but I don't want to just hang out. If that makes sense, yeah, you know what I'm yeah, saying because like that brings the, the best out of me. Because if yeah. you never, if you, if you've never hated it, if you've never hated anybody, then you don't know what love is. Because mm. if you don't know what cold is, you don't know what hot is. You don't know what light is, you don't know what dark is. You get what I'm saying? So yeah. this whole politically correct bullshit about you can't be mad, you can't be sad, you can't be this, you can't be that, you can't know. That's it's it's incorrect because you're <clears throat> you're limiting yourself, and that's another thing is I don't limit myself. I don't try to be this perfect person or walk this perfect line or. Uh, follow some theology or some person or some way I find my own way and I make a lot of mistakes but I always find myself back on my track if that makes sense and so that way of living allows you to be able to be so open because Mm. if I had so many uh, taglines like I'm a this and I'm a that and I'm a that well all those I'm a stick me in a box and I can't think past those that box I can't think past what that I'm a what it you know that that label of that conscious thinking is so if I don't pigeonhole myself with I'm a this and I'm a that and I'm a this, well, then I have the complete freedom to think, be, feel any way I want because I'm not being judged, looked upon or, or not living up to a standard or, or whatever it is, if that makes sense. Yeah. So in that whole perspective there is kind of you're getting a little bit of me and that's why I feel that I stand out a little bit. But then also I'm not, I, I don't give two shits what people think. Yeah. I don't give two shits, man. I, I could care less. It's not my responsibility to care what you think. And it's not my responsibility to care about you also. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. There's 8 billion people on this earth. It's my responsibility to care about 8 billion people. Fuck. No. All right. So if it offends you, if it hurts you, and if it's this, that, sorry, bud. Move, move on. Move on. 
Yeah, there, there's a there's a bunch there um, that we could go off, but there's one thing uh, I had a, a guy on the <laughs> podcast who's uh, who's now a really close friend of mine. His name's Taylor Cecil, and uh, he hit me mm. with a quote that I absolutely love that says, "Knowledge is for the ego, wisdom is for the soul." And I think that you know you kind of yeah. were getting at that a little bit uh, in what you were saying. Exactly, you know, because any book that you read, <clears throat> anybody that you listen to, anything that you hear is already borrowed knowledge. Mm. It's already written. It's already been thought about. It's already been put out there. So again, that is just borrowed. But if I go somewhere I've never been, if I have to experience something like divorce, so if I have to experience something like, you know, an injury or, or whatever it is, well, now I become so much more wise because I experienced something myself. Mm. I'm not borrowing in it from anybody else. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And that will never go away. Knowledge, you'll forget. Experience, you'll never forget. And especially if they're deep ones, you know? And I've had a lot, a lot of deep ones that they're, 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 they're ingrained in me, <laughs> mm. you know? So uh, uh, that, that's where you make your changes. Man. That's where you make your changes. Yeah, it's funny. If your bike isn't working good, if your, bike isn't, if your bike's not set up well, what do you do? You make changes. Plain and simple. Yeah, no, 100%. It's, um, <clears throat> it's funny, like I, I can... I look at you and I mean like I've been a fan since, literally since the day I met you you know and you can watch the Thank sort you. of the change in your like your personality not not your personality you always seem like the same dude but there's like a this evolution with you that is very constant and it's very like visible and I think that's one of the things that draws people to you um, and it's one of the things that I talk about a bit is that and, and you actually said it beautifully when you say that the I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a this. It does put you in a box. And there's like this collective box of culture and society that everybody's in. And then you get the the rhinos that just go a little bit outside that box. And then they're the kind of outcast dudes at first. And then they're saying shit that doesn't really make sense at first. And then that all of a sudden you get a few people that are like fuck rhino's really on to something rhino's you know it's cool what rhino is saying and then all of a sudden that that normal box starts to become a little bit bigger and you know guys like yourself i think are responsible for shifting culture in a way um at times because you are down to get outside of that box and it takes the few of the things that you described about yourself like just genuinely not giving a fuck what other people think and it's funny like i I think that um, even in myself from starting this, I've found a freedom to be myself completely. And it's funny, like you, you sort of, you watch people um, that they get like notoriety and then they, you're like, oh, this person started to change with um, the success that he's having and, and blah, 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 blah. And it's like hard to relate to that if you've never been in a situation where you are changing, you are growing, you are getting more successful. And with that, more people are like watching you. I don't think from what I can see that, um, a lot of times it's, uh, the thing itself that changes you, but you just kind of, there's like a confidence that comes with it, a freedom, a uh, confidence in yourself. And the fact that like, there kind of is like whatever your final form is, you kind of always were that, but you were covered up. And then I think what you see is like you said, you know, you're covered by dirt and it's like over time you can either like, you can just fucking uncover yourself and you end up sort of being that, that final thing. Um, but it's not so much like an external thing that changes that. It's just, you're on this, this path and you just feel more comfortable and then you give less fucks and you can be more genuine to yourself without like the, you don't feel the risk anymore because you, you're okay with it internally. Yeah. I mean, you're, 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 you're hundred percent right. So the, <clears throat> one of the most beautiful flowers in the world has the most, the most amazing scent to it is called a Lotus, right? What does it come out of mud? You know? Mm. So it's like a metaphor that something beautiful is coming out of mud. That's where it grows from. And so, yeah, that, that's the thing. And, and people have to realize that the, our main focus in life about being a human being, and that's why we chase money, that's why we chase fame, that's why we chase sex, that's why we chase marriage, all these things is to have freedom. It's freedom. Once we think we can get enough money, we think we'll have freedom. Once we think we have enough power, we'll think we'll have freedom. But that's not the case because you don't have simplicity to yourself. So one, you have to have simplicity right in your life to be able to have the freedom to be able to be creative 
And once you have creativity in your life, you're going to be happy. Okay. Because you have to have simplicity. So you have the time to be able to go ha- have the time to be able to have freedom to go do this, spend some time with your kids, spend some time here, do your hobbies, go on a holiday, go for a drive, do, do the things that allow you to have that spark in you. Right. And then having that freedom will allow you to be creative. Just like I say, man, I'm going to go there and, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to start that. And you know, what? I'm going to play the drums. You know, so you're starting to be creative and I've never seen an unhappy, a creative per- person unhappy. You mm. get what I'm saying? So those are the ingredients to happiness. Everybody's trying to find happiness, but you can't just be happy. You can't find it. You, you, you either are happy or not happy. Nothing is going to make you happy. You get what I'm saying? So that, that's, that's the first thing. And that's where I have gone down my path in my life is like, look, I'm, I've, I've made money. Did it make me happy or no? Now what? <clears throat> I was one of the best. Now what? I had big houses. Now what? I had nice cars. Now what? I, I had sex with women. Now what? You know what I mean? So that all these things that everybody's so attached to trying to fill that void mm. of what they're missing. And they're always trying to fill that void with something. And something is never going to give you the thing you're looking for. And that is called freedom and happiness, right? And it's not like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a happy person just jumping around on butterflies. You know what I mean? I mean, if you took a camera out to my place, you'd be like, Oh my God, this is the most entertaining thing I've ever seen. This guy just jumped out of the sauna naked, chasing a pig because yeah. he ran under his fence, you know yeah. what I'm saying? So, so I, I, you know, but you gotta be, and the other thing about being, having freedom is having, being a full rounded person because mm. <clears throat> so many theologies and so many philosophies and, and now all this politically correct bullshit is limiting you as, as a human being. You're only supposed to allow you to use a fluffy side of you. But what mm. about my anger? What about my lust? What about my greed? What about my, this, everything that's inherently in me. And if I don't exercise those things, those things are only going to get bigger claws, bigger teeth, and they're going to hang on to me more and they're going to come out somewhere else. So you have to be able to use that side of you very intelligently and use it like a bullet, not a shotgun. If I get Mm. mad, you'll know I'm mad, but then I'm done with it. I don't carry it around. You know, if I'm greedy, I'm greedy in one spot because my life is is asking for that or requiring that right now, if that makes sense. You know, I don't just go around chasing women all over, but when there's time that it's time to get make some love, I'll make some love. You know what I mean? So use these things as a bullet and not just spread them around because then you start becoming so much more, you're so you almost become chaotic. Mm. You don't, you don't know what's going to be coming out of you. You have no idea what's coming out of you. And then you start, and then anxiety starts. Does it make sense? Cause you have no idea what's going to happen. So you're just sitting on pins and needles and that's anxiety. Right. And so, you know, having that, and then also you're saying that, Hey, you know, I kind of stick outside the box, but look what, and I'm not, and, and, and anybody that's listening to me, trust me, I'm not, I'm just making, I'm just making examples. I'm not comparing myself, trust me. But if you look at <clears throat> the theologies and everything that everybody follows, like a Jesus, like a Buddha, like a Lao Tzu, like a Muhammad, like a this, what were they? They were called rebels. Why? Because they thought outside the box, man. Mm. They thought outside the box from that time. You get what I'm saying? Were they ridiculed? Were they this? Were they that? Were they killed? Yes, they were because they thought outside the box. That's it. That's it. But now everybody is stuck in their box that they're not being what, you know, what, what that Messiah or whatever kind of represented it as being a rebel, not by making conflict or making hassle, but having your own way. Mm. Stop being a fucking duplicate, man. Stop being a duplicate. Go around the track, go to the race and go look at all the girls. They all look the same. Go look at all the boys. They all look the same. Nobody has their own little look anymore because everybody's following everybody. I go around town. And I just watch everybody. I'm like, oh, my God, look at human beings, just a bunch of followers, just trying to fit in with everybody else. And nobody wants to look like their own way. Not, not that you have to look weird or different. Just what makes puts a smile on your face? Mm. What puts that spark in your ass? You know what I'm saying? To, 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 to actually look at this life and go, man, this thing's amazing. You know, because if you really think about it, look, look at what we're experiencing. It's the most complex the most amazing experience you could ever experience. If you could tell me a better experience than this, then I'd believe you, but you're never gonna. So why don't you honor that? Why don't we respect that? You get what I'm saying? Instead of down that and poor me and this sucks and that person and and this was wrong and this, you know what I'm saying? You're not seeing the magic in it. You're not seeing the spark in this life. And maybe that's what I have done is, is, is saw as, is created the spark in my life because I took the comfort away. Mm. That's the problem with man nowadays is they're too damn comfortable. 
you know, they go, they buy a house, it's all done, built up, da, 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 they get the key, they pick it up. Oh, it's a little bit cold, a little bit hot. They sit on the couch, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the wife brings them some food. Maybe they go for a walk. Oh shit, the, the floor's dirty. They press the button. They got Julio to, to, to clean their pool. You know what I mean? It's just, it's too comfortable. And when you become comfortable, you become stale. And when you become comfortable, you become uncreative, right? Well, and that, that's not a human being. We're supposed to be pushed. We're supposed to be pushed. We are a, a being, we are a human being that can handle so much pressure, so much, you know, pain and, 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 and agony, you know, just cause I've been through it myself is that people aren't, re- aren't understanding and honoring this, this being that we're in It's the most complex mechanism in all of the universe that we know of. And we deny it every day. Right. So that's kind of how I look at my thing and maybe why I have this outlook because I look at life completely different than most, you know, I don't look at the negatives of the stuff. It's, it, I mean, I, the sun, the clouds, the wow, it's just, it's all amazing. Cause I can't think of another, a better experience because I've tried. Yeah. yeah. I've tried. The, oh the yeah. F- you can read a, you can read a book that says there's a, there's a heaven that, that is thing, but it's in the book. You can read another book that says you can have 27 virgins. That's yeah. in a book. It's not in front of your, you're not in front of your eyes. That's called reality. You know, everything else is dreams, baby. Everything else is dreams because there's nowhere to be. If my, if my mind goes somewhere, there's nowhere because you're always now here. Same word. You know what I'm saying? And, and so that's where everybody's always trying to go somewhere to find something, create something, but they're, they're not realizing that it's now here. Just like even when I teach motocross, even today, going through a corner, the guy was like, man, I was focused on the exit of my corner coming in, exit of the corner to do this triple, but I kept messing up the entrance. I said, exactly, because you're too far ahead. Yeah, you're in the yeah, future. Yeah. You're, 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 you know, you're, 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 you're here, but you're always now here, you know? Mm. <laughs> you, you, so that's kind of the same thing in life. It's like motocross is life. Yeah. It really is. Uh, I completely, completely so. agree. The, uh, the interesting thing too, so you want to talk about like people chasing happiness. So for you to be mm. like, it's inherently flawed, literally from that sentence right there. Like trying to be happy <laughs> by definition states that in the current moment, you're unhappy. And that creates mm-hmm. a, a real problem. That, that creates a real problem for, for happiness because it, it becomes like this thing that, that you're, you're constantly chasing. It becomes a state that, that you're trying to achieve and then by by even putting that label on it, it just completely demotes the experience that you're having right now. <clears throat> yep. Well, there's <clears throat> there's a couple main points that I focus on. One is try not to become anything. Because mm. if you're trying to become something, you're always going to be in tension because you're not there yet. Yeah. And right? it's the same that's the I same argument with cyclist. happiness. I want to become this. Yeah. I want to become, yeah, I want to become more beautiful. I want to become more skinny. Well, you're always going to be in tension because you're not at that becoming, you know what I mean? And then, and then, you know, also learn how to be comfortable being uncomfortable Mm. because right now this whole life is uncomfortable. So you better learn how to be comfortable and it's not going to get any easier. I can tell you that. And I'm sure you guys are finding that out in Australia. Okay. So you better learn how to be comfortable, (laughs) you know, and then, um, you know, and don't all uh, also don't ever, you know, kind of, um, you know, compare, compare mm-hmm. what's happening now to what you would want it to be. You understand? And, and that's what everybody, ah, I wish it was this, or man, I wish the weather was this, or I wish it was a little bit colder. I wish it was that. It's because again, you're always going to be felt less than because you're not getting what you're wanting. You're always going to be let down because everything you're, you're coming into, you're comparing to what you would rather it be. You know what I mean? Instead of just accepting what it is. And when you can accept what it is, then you're going to be with it. And you're not, there's, there's no tension in between. Cause you're not, you're not in between what's happening and where you'd want to be. Mm. Does that make sense? No. Yeah. No, and 100%. you know, there's just a few things that, uh, there's a few things that we do that we're always, that we're always kind of, you know, and I'm not, there's a word I'm looking for, but just like kind of comparing what's happening at this moment to what we would rather it be. Yeah, you know, have, and have I feel you, that we miss so many golden golden moments at that time. Just like I say, okay, hey, uh, there's a lot of times I went to had to go to some functions with my ex wife, and I'm just like, what in the world am I? I don't even want to be here. Don't even yeah. want to be here. <clears throat> so half of me is there, 
But maybe that opportunity that I was looking for for the last three years was sitting in the corner, but I was did I was so uninterested in being there that my mind was somewhere else that I never went and talked to that guy. But that guy was an opportunity that would have set me up for my life. Mm. Now life was like stupid. We had the opportunity you want to be there, but you just weren't you weren't present enough. So now we have to go down the 91 to the five to the 405 down to the 91 in traffic. So where this opportunity, I'm not going to come to you for another three years. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. if you don't want to be somewhere, don't be somewhere. Don't ever show up halfway because again, you might miss opportunities. You might miss golden moments. I feel, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and just come from having kids and doing these things and being that guy. I fuck, I'm at this baseball game. What am I? Jesus. You know? Yeah. You know, but I miss golden, I miss golden moments, man. I miss golden yeah. moments because my mind was at a race and my mind was training. My mind was in the gym, but my son was playing t-ball. Golden moments, you know? Well, you're, you're not alone in that, man. Oh. I think that's an affliction that, yeah. uh, you know what I mean? That's, I, I don't think that, um, yeah, yeah, you're definitely, you're definitely just not alone in, in that. And there's so many people that, that would be the norm, not the exception for most of humanity. Yeah. Well, especially for men, because men are uh, men are, you know, extroverts. So we're always trying to achieve, trying to get next, trying to conquer, trying to, mm. you know, that's kind of our DNA. That's our DNA. And, and, and we when we when we use it right, we are very uh, productive creatures. But when we use it wrong, we're very destructive creatures, you know. And so, you know, that that's men. And so that's where I think grandparents are so much better because they learn the mistakes that they made when they were parents or they were so busy trying to make a living or yeah, yeah, accomplish yeah. who they wanted to, who, who they wanted to be that they missed the children. You know what I mean? Yeah. That and, actually and, and does see, make yeah. sense. So I know. <clears throat> yeah. You know, cause again, you, you, you don't, you don't see, you don't see your mistakes until you take, you, you step away from it, look back and go, ah, you know, just like any retired athlete you talk to, they're going to tell you, man, if I, if I knew what I knew now back then, it's because you took a step away from me. You have a perspective of it, you know, just like hot, cold, you know, anger, love, you have a perspective of it. And that's what, uh, is very important. And that's where I think, you know, some, <clears throat> some motocrossers, I know that you can't do this because you'd lose your ride, but some motocrossers that are struggling should take a step back a little bit, mm. you know, maybe take some time off instead of even when they get injured, you know, don't keep training, don't keep training at all. Yeah, the stupidest thing you could ever do is keep training when you're injured. Just get away from it. Go do something else. Find a new hobby. Find something that's going to make you more creative. Find something that's going to challenge your mind. Find something that's mm -hmm. going to challenge something else. So then that when you come back, you're just not the, the same stale person and already burnt out because you've been training fucking half body. You know what I mean? You, you've come back a better creature because you, you progressed yourself somewhere that you wouldn't have just doing the same old training and how you do anything is how you do everything. 100%. And everything is linked together. Every, sp every spoke has to talk to itself, each other to make that wheel round. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and that's kind of what I would say with athletes, man, get away. Cause I did it completely wrong. I was fucking lifting weights the second day. I'm like, you idiot. And by the time it was time to go training, I was tired. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because I could, I didn't have, I didn't have the confidence to just allow myself to rest. You know, uh, I'm I, and, and it just, yeah sorry mate um a motocross rider is too like narrow-minded and too singularly <clears throat> focused because i mean there's there's like a couple arguments that you could make right that having like a single focus a single dedication it's like a samurai sword and you can develop because i think that personally you could develop yourself um as a as a really great human through the vehicle of being like a motocross or supercross athlete but then on the flip side of that you could also be so focused and so <clears throat> narrow-minded that you actually don't look at your self as a human growing as it as important as winning races so like within the vehicle of motocross i think you could fully develop the human psyche the human body um the human spirit through motocross but then i also think that you could do the opposite and neglect it because you're so focused on external things like winning etc 
Yeah, I, I definitely think this, the same, you know, so when I look back at motocross and the way I teach motocross, it's almost like with a philosophy, you know, motocross is so complex, it needs its own philosophy, yeah. you know, because of what, <clears throat> how fast things are happening. Yes, Formula One, things happen fast, but the, the road doesn't change. I'm sorry. Mm. We have bumps. We have bumps. Well, what kind of bumps? Are they square edge bumps? Are they big bumps? Are they small bumps? Are they chatter bumps? Are they breaking bumps? Or are they sand bumps? Do they have ruts in them? Do they have rocks in them? You get what I'm saying? Yeah. What, oh, a turn. Well, what kind of turn? Is it a sand turn? Does it have a hook? Is it a berm? Is it a bowl? Is it a, you know, is it a deep rut? Is it a long rut? Is it a short rut? Is it a hook? <laughs> is it Washougal so, dirt? Is it after South 40 people, dirt? Is it Glen Helen yeah. dirt? Is it Hangtown yeah. dirt? Yeah, I, mean, I would imagine, you know, I would imagine the, the surfaces on pavement change, you know, change track to track of course but all of a sudden we don't have you don't have 40 guys going through one rut and all of a sudden it's two foot deep deeper you know what i mean or a or a jump where it's rutted all the way across and you've been taking this rut now all of a sudden now you're catching your foot peg so again what i'm saying is every sport's difficult every racer is amazing but our sport is to another level i feel the 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 presence it takes to ride to race motocross Okay. Mm. I hear these formula one drivers talking when they're driving. No, 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 no. We don't talk. There's no way I could fucking talk. The only thing I do is yelling at somebody or myself, but I can't hold a conversation. So things are happening so fast and happening so violently that it puts you into this present moment. Your mind stops. You get what I'm saying? And that is the addiction to motocross. That is addiction to it. That's why our sport is fed and led by, by vets. Why? Because it is that point of no mind because mm-hmm. things are happening so fast. Things are, things are coming up. Uh, new newness is coming up every lap that it keeps you in this present moment. And being in that present moment is so addicting. That's why adrenaline is addicting. That's why gambling's addicting. That's why sex is addicting all these things because it's putting you to that present moment. Yes. Whenever you put fear in somebody, they come to the present moment and that is addicting to people. And so that is one thing when motocross is, but just the, the level of, of in, endurance that it takes or physical ability that it takes, you know what I'm saying? And the level that trust that it takes and the trust in yourself and the ability to crash, get hurt and get back on your motorcycle or see somebody crash, get hurt, get hauled off in an ambulance and you get on your motorcycle and go race and jump that same jump. Mm. You know what I'm saying? That's a special being. That's a special being. You know, they, we, people don't realize, yeah, motocrossers are dumb. They're this. No, they're not dumb. They're very, very, very intelligent beings. Maybe not mentally, maybe not this, but the being inside is something that, that uh, isn't out there much. They're, they're, they're rare beings. So I tell the kids that I train, I go, look, you're not, a, you're not a normal kid. You're a special kid. Most kids can't ride a motorcycle like you. Most kids don't have trust like they have in you. Most kids can't just turn off the fear like you have. Most kids can't come back from an injury like you did being knocked out for so long. So you know what? You have to eat different, talk different, shit different, think different, sleep different, because you are different. Because if you start staying like the rest of your friends, you're going to be this domesticated you know, you know, uh, smothered kid that, that, that is just following ways of, of he does not know what, because he's just been taught to follow, you know what I'm saying? Because that's what schooling is, is teaching to follow. So that, that way I just, I really respect motocross and I really expect the, the athlete that comes out of it, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Our sport is unbelievable. Not just because I do it. It's, it's unbelievable. I've, I've, the, 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 the consequence. And then I'm going to go to, then I'm going to go, sorry. Then I'm going to go to why people pigeonhole themselves. I think they pigeonhole themselves because of the fear. You get what I'm saying? Because of mm. everything that can happen. Okay. If I, if I play baseball, I got to worry about a ball and a bat and maybe that's it. Right. Eh. But in a motorcycle, motocross, I got to worry about the track conditions changing. I got to worry about my bike breaking. I got to worry about someone else hitting me. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of stuff that can happen. And that's why motocrossers aren't the most confident athletes in the world because of the, mm, the so risk. many consequences that could happen that that's out of our control. Yeah. Is that, if that makes sense, yeah. you know, so and that's why you see you push that at motocrossers very, yeah. And so how you do, whatever your main focus is, whatever your main theology is, is what's going to start taking over the rest of your life. 
You get what I'm saying? So if I have a fixated mindset of how I went about motocross and and getting myself pigeonholed and having all these stupid ass, uh, um, you know, um, um, what do people have uh, to traditions and stuff? Um, like attachments. No, not attachments. Uh, superstitions. Sorry. sorry. Yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah. All these superstitions. You know what I mean? You know, yeah. they, they get all this stuck in this 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 box of superstition. Got to this, got to this. Well, that's going to follow them outside of their life. Then they're going to be so afraid to do these things because they're afraid of bad things happening. And again, superstition is for the weak-minded, my friends. It's for the weak-minded. So anytime you have a superstition, just know that you're weak-minded. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I would totally agree with that. It's plain, it's um, plain and simple. It's plain and simple. Walking, you're going to walk under a ladder and you're going to have fucking bad luck. Come on, bud. Yeah, yeah. Come on. You're going to break a, you're gonna break glass and you're going to have, you, oh, Jesus. You know what I mean? That's just from, that is, it, again, that's what's happening from this world. All these things, these superstitions have just been passed down and passed down and passed down and passed down and passed down from uneducated people. From uneducated people. And we're following it. And, and they're in our politics. It's the same for how many hundreds of years? Our schooling system, our religions, they're all fucking old, man. And this is why I feel humanity's stuck because there's no, we're, we're a creature that is supposed to progress. We're a creature that is supposed to be challenged. And these things have suffocated us because there's no growth in them and they're old and they're boring. And we, we've, out, we've, out, we've, out, uh, we've out evolved them. We really have. You know what I'm saying? We're following stuff that's 3,000 years old. Yes, there's gems in it, but man, we're completely different creatures. A schooling system that was done in the 20s, 30s. I mean, what? You know what I'm saying? And, and, and a political system that is just, you know, maybe they broke it on the way, but it's just, it's just old. Everything needs to be done. But these are the things that are following us that, are, that we're following and things that are leading our lives in this world. And if they were so great, then why is the world the way it is? Tell me that. Mm. You know what I mean? Uh, it's funny, like, uh, you think, you know how you say, like, things are so old. Things are so old. But they're also not in the sense that the Roman Empire was in control uh, of the United Kingdom for longer than America's even been a country. And people yeah, don't, know. you know what I mean? <laughs> like, so the, the perspective of yeah. time is, is actually, like... Uh, I think a lot of people get stuck in, and they look at things in terms of like their lifespan. Like they're going to be in this, uh, yep. in this world for 80 years and they're looking at, at all of humanity through the lens of this 80 years that they're going to be around when they have no perspective of, you know, the actual time that things have taken. And I mean, like Australia, dude, like Australia wasn't even a fucking... That, like it was still called uh, a fucking um, like it didn't even have like, a technical name while America was even a country. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, so like yeah. we really yeah, things it, things are so old, but they're also not at the exact same time. If you like you said, you know, a, a moment ago, like if you really zoom out, uh, things make a lot mm -hmm. more sense in terms of like why things are the way they are now. But people really should have the perspective that they're only around for such a fucking small time. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're, you're hundred percent right. But just in this last 50 years, humanity has had nitro in their progression, yeah. you know, and they're evolving just with the computers and all this. Yeah. I mean, we have gone and we haven't progressed in a 2000 years as much as we have in the last 50 years. Oh, if that 100%. makes sense. So yeah. we're on this, we're, we're on this super fast track of, of evolving to something or we need to slow it down. You know what I mean? So there's something that's happening. And, and that's why I'm saying is, Hey, look, we're, we're, we're thinking different. We're, we're feeling different. We're reacting different things. Things are happening different in the world now. You know what I mean? Completely different now. I mean, it, it, yeah, it's just, it's a different time. So we, I, to me, things have to catch up. Things yeah. have to catch up. Just like right racing, you know, I'd like to really start talking more about racing than, you know, all that, this stuff. Um, it's kind of like racing. It's with the motorcycles. The motorcycles are progressing so fast, so fast. You know, the yeah. Japanese and Austrians are on a, just a terror to have the best bike. Okay, cool. But who's, who's, who's teaching the riders to, mm. to catch up with the development of the motorcycles? You get what I'm saying? Who, where's the link? Where's the link? Who, who's the guy doing that? So that, that's, that, that's the problem in their sport. And that's the problem that everybody has with me 
And that's what I have the problem with everybody else <laughs> is that I'm trying to bridge this gap. I'm trying to bridge the gap. I'm trying to teach you how to ride these motorcycles that are progressing every damn year. Getting yeah. better, better, faster, faster. I ride these 450s. I was even talking to Brian Deegan where it's like, dude, what the fuck are these bikes? Dude, they're, just, they're almost unfun to ride. They're yes. just so, they're so fast. They're just unfun to ride. And I go, look, we're skilled ass riders. We're skilled ass riders. So I only can imagine Joe Bob that's 250 that rides once a week or, or Tommy that just got out of the military and he's 250 and he went to the store and says, what kind of bike should I ride? I haven't ridden in 10 years. And I'm like, well, yeah, you're a big dude. You should get the 450. Yeah, I should. And he goes out there, whiskey throttles it and he's fucking half dead. You understand? And then the 450s have outgrown the stadiums. They have outgrown the Supercross stadiums. That's why racing's boring to me. They're too fast. They're too fast. They're too big. You can, you can, you, you can make too big of mistakes. Uh, you can make a mistake and not make a mistake because there's so much power. And I yeah. feel that's making racing boring. You know what I mean? I really do. So that's the thing is the bikes are progressing so much. We need someone to, to bridge that gap, which, is, which I've been working on is trying to bridge that gap to have technique catch up to bike because you can change your suspension, handlebars, tires, everything you want. You can spend all your, your honeymoon money on your motorcycle to make it better. But if you don't ride it better, it's still going to be more dangerous. And actually you just made it more faster. So you probably just made yourself more dangerous. Mm. You get what I'm saying? The motorcycle doesn't ride itself. You ride it. So if you don't work on yourself, well, then, then you're always, you're always going to be limited. Just like if I'm trying to make a kid faster, I don't just try to make him faster by the stopwatch and, and by the throttle. I make him faster, but uh, I make him a specimen by he's quicker. He's more strong. He's more stable. He's more coordinated. He's more efficient. He has more balance. He has more, um, you know, more flexibility, whatever it is. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm speeding up the device that's riding the motorcycle, which is the rider. Yeah, yeah. I can't just ask someone to go faster because if I ask someone to go faster, well, that means things are happening faster. There's more inertia. There's more momentum happening. So then you better be able to react that or I just made your kid more dangerous because I told him to go faster when the body, the mind, the eyes, the reactions, the nervous system is not fucking ready. And that's the problem in the sport. Everybody wants everybody to go so fast. They're not ready to go fast, dude. These kids aren't ready to go fast. They're still little bitty babies. You know what I mean? They, they, they bring these kids out there and they're like little 11, 12, 13 year olds and they're little babies and they're just trying to just faster, harder, jump that. And I'm like, my God, people. Well, this is why only not even half a percent of the people make it. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I was yeah. just at the track the other day and I was talking to Larry Brooks and I was looking at the writers he's working with, Derek Drake. Um, 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 God, I can't think of their names, but a few really, really, really top guys that were just a year ago, two years ago, that were the top amateur guys. And I'm like, dude, these kids are going to be good. Yeah. And now they're on the B team. You know what I'm saying? And if they don't do something special, they're done. Because yeah. their bikes will never compete against the A team. You know? And there's another problem. There's another fucking problem, okay? With Supercross. Why don't we have a 450 class that runs a whole series? Which we do. Why don't we have a 250 class that runs a whole series? Okay, we have these factory bikes, these factory 250S, you have enough riders, you're telling me I'm going to put my 16-year-old kid in with Christian Craig, and he has a chance to beat him? The dude's almost 30 years old, you know what I'm saying? So why is he, why is he racing against kids that are just trying to learn? We need to have a 450 class, we need to have a 250 class, and they're missing so much entertainment if they could have all those 250F guys racing together every fucking Supercross. That'd be amazing. And then you have a development class that you bring them up and you have an East-West championship, yeah. right? And if someone gets hurt in the big class, you can take, you can bring somebody up from the, the development class. Yeah. Just like Formula One does, just like this. Yeah. We need to have a development class at the Supercross to bring in more entertainment. The 250F guys, factory guys can race against each other every single race. And then we might not have guys that are starting to miss their chance, not even be seen. You know what I mean? Spend all this time, all this energy, the, the family spend all their money, spend all their time. They've been to hospitals and injuries and this and that, and they just get cut short before they even can start. Yeah. That's sad. It's sad. What, you know what I mean? What do you think about... And I think we have the room to do it. What do you think about having a 252 stroke class? Like, you know how you said have the 250 class that runs the whole <laughs> series, like the 450s? What would you think about putting them on 252 strokes and then having the 250F East and West as the development series? Um, well, the only thing is with that is that there's only a few companies that make two strokes. 
You know hey, what I mean? So is that going to be real, got all the, lucra- real lucrative? Honda's yeah? still got all the money. I mean, but what I'm saying, is that going to be real? Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, they could still make it, but I'm saying, is that going to be very lucrative for those manufacturers? KTM, Gas Gas, Husqvarna, 100%. You know, Yamaha still makes theirs maybe, but it's such it's old development. So mm. that's the only thing that I'm saying. If it, if it could help the manufacturers, then cool. But it's kind of almost like we're beating down a dead door with two, two strokes if, if, if there's no future with them if nobody's saying hey let's come back with some mm. it's it's get these kids on these 250f because that's where they're going to be riding next so you might as well you might as well be right there and then if like say yeah. if someone does let's say if the star team gets hurt well they can go down and pick someone on a 250f and put them right on the team like they did with uh uh george russell i guess with um mercedes oh, you know with what I mean? the, yeah they went yeah, to williams yeah. and picked him yeah. yeah and picked him and put him on there and he almost fucking won the race so that's what I'm saying. And, and so you never know this one kid that you took from the bottom and you finally gave him a good bike, which I've seen many times. I've seen Mitch take people, put them on that bike. And all of a sudden they're, they're top three. He, he takes that bike away from, them, they go back to their team. They're in their 15th, 20th. Is a factory 250F. I've seen this Gossler. Oh, sorry, mate. Is a, is a factory 250F. Like, let's say if you're a privateer on a <clears throat> privateer Kawasaki, and then you get a call up to ride one of Mitch's bikes. Is it that much better? Oh, oh my God. <clears throat> it's not even, you don't even have a chance. You have no chance. Really? You have no chance. It's, they're, they're that much better. Yeah. And then factory, it's, it's on another level. So when I first rode my first factory bike in, in, well, the first factory bike I think I ever rode was 1989. I was at Carlsbad Raceway testing for Kawasaki and I was still team green, you know, and yeah. I was amateur national pro <clears throat> and Dogger was my hero. I'm just like, oh. God, machine, you know, Dogger, just the way he rode. And Kawasaki was there. And they're like, hey, well, Dogger's late. You want to ride his 500? I'm like, no what? way. Because he was getting, he was testing for the, he's testing for the donation, or testing for the USGP. Yeah. And I said, yeah, I got on, I got on a thing, I was riding and riding and riding, and just, just thinking I'm Dogger, you know. I'm out there, and then all of a sudden I see him start waving me down, and I'm, I turn my head in the corner, you know, so like uh, I didn't see him, and I kept going. They had to get on the track and fucking wave me down to get me off the bike, but that was like the first factory bike, and I couldn't believe how little vibration there was. Mm. You know what I'm saying? There's little vibration, and then in '96 I turned factory Kawasaki, and the first time I got to test the vibration, the traction, the horse is. It was unbelievable. Then you go to then you go to HRC. Where do you want your throttle? Where do you want your clutch? You want a smaller, shorter? This, that, this, that. You know, hey, we got twenty inch front wheel. We got eighteen inch rear wheel. We got these. We got forty eights. We got fifty twos. We, it's like it's crazy. You know, so that's where you make that progression, mm. and nobody is ever going to match that. Nobody's gonna ever gonna match that. But <clears throat> I just think that we have to figure out a way to not have these kids and and families spend their whole life in retirement in the sport and then just get their, their their chains cut you know what i mean there has to be a way to keep this going it's because it's a sad it's a sad affair i see it i go to the, the tracks and i see it you know what i mean and i see that i see it in their parents eyes and stuff they're just so bummed that you know think things aren't happening the way that they've been working for 10 12 years mm. you know? and do you think that um so like <laughs> let's just expand on this idea if we're um, we've got the ability to make some changes now. Like, what do you think the the the, the TV package looks like for a series like that? Does it does it even do we even need a TV package? Is there an online package where that that class uh, races at a different time because we don't want to fuck with the way that the night show works right now? Or like, how do you see it logistically actually fitting into the program of Supercross having this new class that you that you want to have? Uh, well, one thing, um, yes, it can fit in there because when you watch the monster cup, what's one of the most exciting races, the eighties, baby, right? (laughs) Yeah. The eighties, right? That's one of the most exciting races. So why not? When I, when I was first watching supercross when I was young, they used to have eighties for a, uh, uh, main, uh, um, halftime show and Eddie Hicks and all the badass, badass eighties would come out there. And that was one of the coolest things ever, you know, because you're, you're so used to watching the good guys. But then you get to see these younger guys. So anyways, yes, they could put it in. Why, why can't they, they fill the TV package? If you think about it, I would like somebody to actually it's put a timer on how long yeah. the TV. Exactly. So how long is the TV thing? It's just like uh, football, football. It's a three hour uh, game, right? You know, they play 11 minutes. Yeah, yeah. 11 
the 12, 11 to 13 minutes they play because every 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 play is two to three seconds, four yeah. seconds. You get what I'm saying? So yeah. actually, you only watched 11 minutes of play in three fucking hours. So it's the same thing in, in Supercross. I think I added it up, and you're only watching an hour or something of yeah. racing in a three-hour program. So take out all the bullshit that you guys got on there with all these announcers and things. They're just filling up time that because I don't have to go take a piss, you know, 15 times to yeah. just you know to get racing. So if we, what, why are people watching Supercross for racing? So why don't we fill the damn program up with racing? It's, it's pretty simple, I think. You know, it maybe don't do so much damn track work. Yeah, don't make yeah. the track so simple. Don't make the track so fast. Don't make them so dangerously fast. You get what I'm saying? Back in my day, we, the things were more peaked. So when we hit, we stuck a little bit and things were slower. Now they're going so fast because all the jumps are so rounded and the tracks are so easy that if they do make a mistake, it's so high speed that it becomes massively violent. Mm. And that's what we got to take away too. You know, they tried to cut down the tracks, just like you're seeing in all the amateur races and all this stuff. Let's make the tracks smoother. Let's make the tracks this, but you've actually made the track faster. And now yeah. you're getting people to go over their over their heads easier, not so much in pros, but then the mistake becomes more violent because you're creating, you have momentum behind it. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and so there's a few things that need to change. And I think if you slowed it down, you'd probably see better racing because nobody's going to stuff anybody going around a corner doing 30. Mm. Impossible. But in my day, we could stick a front wheel in there because it was you're not doing 30 miles an hour. You know what I mean? Uh, you could, you know, you would make mistakes in between some of the rhythms. So someone might chase you. But now everybody's just doing these four, three, fours, all this stuff. Everything's the same. I always thought, why don't you put a section in there that had no rhyme or reason, reason to it? A sand yeah. wolf, some whoops, a fucking double, sand whoops with this. You know what I mean? That... It just had no rhyme or reason, but you had to try to figure something out. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Because we can't make th we can't make we can't make jumps bigger because we'll make it more dangerous. <clears throat> and that's what we don't need. I really like this Atlanta Motor Speedway coming up because I feel now those 450s can get up and run because these stadiums are suffocating them. So with these these Motor Speedways, I think it's a good thing because you can you can you're going to bring more speed. You can bring more creativity to it. Right, NASCAR has their road races, but they host a circle. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Formula One has their night races, but they have their daytime. You know, MotoGP the same thing. So I think Supercross needs to have those one-offs also. You mm. know what I mean? And that's where I think motocross and Supercross have gone so wrong is that everything looks the same. Why don't we have a Supercross track just sand? All sand. I don't know. Do something different. Motocross tracks. Why don't we have a motocross track that maybe just has one that has a that doesn't have really have any jumps in it? Why does every mm. track have to be so littered with jumps that you can't even, that there's no rhythm to it? You know, that's the problem. I go to all these amateur tracks that we ride and they're so littered with jumps and stupid little obstacles that you cannot even find a rhythm. You know what I mean? Who really passes on jumps, so to speak, outdoors? You know, it's more, you know, setting things up and things. So I just think tracks need to change. I think everybody tried to go to the safe, 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 but almost made it more dangerous, dangerous, dangerous because you created more speed. Mm. you know yeah and with then these like fast fast bikes you don't have the um the unpredictability as well like it, it was a trip for me when i first moved to america to see pretty much like a practice goes out and everybody does everything the first lap bar like two or three sections <laughs> yeah. and you're like what the fuck this is too easy man like if you can go to a new race on a new weekend and the first lap of practice you're doing the entire track it's like obviously there's there's no element of unpredictability here anymore and then i think that um it's it's impressive like that's one thing that's cool about it is it's impressive how it's just like they just sharpen the blades so much these guys like they know the tracks they know the jumps they know the distances they know the triples they know and you're right like there's an effort in that that would make it safer but it also you you get it so routine that these guys can extract every <clears throat> single tiny millisecond out of it they're on the edge completely because they they do have this like um this rhythm that they've got in riding these certain tracks certain distances certain type of up ramps certain type of whoops that yeah they've pushed it just to the absolute extreme now and then you can see like a ken roxon crash or a cooper webb crash like tiny mistakes that lead to these fucking enormous crashes 
Yeah, because you're jump, you're doing things that are, are so much faster, you mm. know, so much bigger. You know, the, the, the you know, again, the writers aren't any better than my days or Jeff Ward days or Bob Hanna days or Roger DeCoster days. It, it, it's not that, you know, the writer's the writer. <clears throat> Roger DeCoster would be top right now as Bob Hanna is, you know, it doesn't matter because there, there, there's, there's that spark in them. There's something special that allows them to be that person. It doesn't matter the era they're in. It's just the bikes that we're riding is causing these, to me, causing these issues and the tracks that they're making are causing these issues. And, and again, you can't have, you know, you can't put more danger out there to try to slow things down or create more racing or whatever. That's not the case. You know, you don't want to make, <clears throat> excuse me, more dangerous jumps or bigger jumps. We just, I feel that we need to go, the manufacturers need to come to an agreement and say, by 2025, we all make 350s. Fuck the Ron Hughes for president. For what? For Ron what? Hughes for president. For what? For what? The thing that the thing is useless. It's too fast. It's too dangerous. It it doesn't fit in a suit in a stadium. You know what I mean? And even outdoors, I've talked to Eli, and he's like, "Man, there's a lot of times he goes, I'm not even trying to race. I'm just trying to control this thing." Mm. That's coming from Eli. Okay. The, the bikes are so dawn. fast. He's like, "I'm not even really. I'm not even. I'm not even trying to. Fo- I'm not even trying to race with anybody. I'm trying to control this damn thing. You know, in inside of racing with people. You know. Yeah, yeah. But it's true." Like when I ride that thing, man, I just every, things disappear. I'm just like, oh fuck. So and I and I do ride a 450, but I really feel that we need to go to a 350 and not a 450. One that would make better racing. Two, there wouldn't be such a jump from 250 to 350. And three, that we would probably save a lot of injury and lives in the average normal day Saturday motor riders. You get what I'm saying? There's so many people, guys out there, that are riding 450s that do not belong on one. Amen. And we would make them probably a little bit safer, you know? And we can do that. We can do that. <laughs> Ryan Hughes just said it, everybody. <laughs> Ryan Hughes just fucking said it. And it's coming from Ryan Hughes. It's not coming from anybody else. Dude, 100,000% yeah. agree. I will not ride a 450. Mm, I've had 450s. I don't fucking really? need a 450. I don't yeah. want a 450 anymore. I got yeah. a KTM 350, and that's what I'm fucking staying on. I ain't fucking leaving because... I'm not scared. <laughs> I'm not scared of that bike constantly. Like, make no mistakes, right? I sit in this fucking studio for eight hours a day, maybe ride once a week. I try my best to ride once a week if I can. And I can't I can't do the 450 thing. I'm not that good. But I don't think that many people are that good. Like, I don't think that the guys... Yeah, no. Like, honestly, you are so fucking right, man. And, like, when you hear the way... um, I, I'd go to the test track, right? And I'd be there when Dunge was doing his motos. And there was times where, like, pretty much Dunge would, like, clear the track and it was just him. And, and he did his 20, just him, no one else around. Like, he was trying to... um, He was fucking Dunge. He could do what he wanted. That bike didn't yeah. even make a fucking sound, man. He could ride the... Ent- when yeah, Dungey look, was on the look, Supercross track look. by himself, yeah, there was no sound that came from that motorcycle. It was a trip. Yeah. And that, as soon as I heard that, I was like, these bikes are way too fucking fast. <clears throat> he's literally not even riding yeah, the they're, thing, they're, they're, and he's doing <clears throat> everything, and he's the champ. Yeah. When you can ride... When you, when you ride a, a 450 slow and just rock then they're fun but when you charge on them then that's when they get dangerous you mm-hmm. get what i'm saying but the thing is is like the bike is so fast right now that the harder you try to ride it the slower you go you actually have to try to go you have to try to go slow so you can actually go fast because if i try to go fast on the bike I actually go slow mm. because the bike is so fast i'm coming in the corner so hard you know the bike's fucking swapping back and forth i'm coming into um you know i'm 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 doing a, this massive pull up coming out of the corner because this thing's yeah. just a rocket ship coming out of the corner, <clears throat> you know, but the pros, they have traction control and they have these things and they have that, you know, but the stock bike doesn't. So it's such a thing. So what I'm saying is when you try to go fast on it, you're actually going slower on it because of how fast it is and all the weight and yeah. all the inertia. When I slow down on it and that's a challenge, I have to try to slow myself down on it. I actually go faster. Yeah. Because now I can use the power. Now I can use that role, that momentum. You know what I'm saying? And then that's when you start doing it. So it's almost like you have to learn. You have to learn how to ride slower to go faster on a 450. Yeah. So, so uh-huh. tell me about yeah. racing a factory 500 then with this logic because they were faster yeah. than fuck. 
Yeah, but they were different. They were different animals. You know what I mean? They didn't get that. They didn't have that torque. They didn't have that inertia. Yeah. You know, they didn't have that. It just they also they didn't have the technology. Mm. I mean, look at the look at you know, the technology. Look at the chassis. Look at the suspension. Look like at you the, couldn't ride the, the, in that the, fast. the electronics on it now. No way. I mean, <clears throat> funny stories. I went to uh, the Vet de Nations in 2011, right? Yeah. And I was going to ride. Yeah, I was going to ride. Rode the 500. They got they got me the 500. They had the same suspension setup that I had for the 95 de Nations and the same motor setup. So they got that from Mitch, put it on the bike. And when I got there, I was sitting on this thing. I'm like, what in the world is this? Dude, the thing was so springy and soft. I'm like, nah, 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 nah. This, this isn't going to work. <clears throat> Give me, click it to make it more like my 450. I went out there and it was the most ill handling thing I've ever ridden in my entire life. I, so I came back, go, uh, go back to the old settings. Went back to the old settings. The thing was like a couch. Mm. You get what I'm saying? So springy and soft. These 450s, you can never make springier and soft. I can't even get my 450 stiff enough now. You know what I mean? With yeah, how much really. inertia I come in with the corners. You know, the, mm. you know, almost five, three springs, five, four springs in the front just for outdoor. You know, this and that. So it's stiff and stiff and stiff and stiff. And so then the, the bike doesn't have so much movement. If the bike has a lot of movement, it gets very wallowy. And mm. then everything gets exaggerated. You know what I'm saying? You want you need this bike to stick and move, stick and move, and that's the, uh, and then that's kind of how you want to ride a 450 a little bit that way. So that things have just changed to allow so much more speed, and the tracks. I mean, look at Unadilla back when I raced it, and now look at Unadilla now. It, it's it's it's, it's it, it, <laughs> they ruined it. They mm. ruined it, and it's so much more dangerous because it's so fast. Back in my day, and, and, and also, you know, Wardy and that stuff, when Unadilla was Una fucking Dilla, when it was three foot of grass, dude, that track was so rough and choppy, you couldn't get speed up. Mm. And that's what I want to see. I want to see a national like that. And I'll, I'll, put my, I'll put my word on it right now. I'll put, I'll put my money on it right now. There will never be an American that ever makes it in Europe again, mm. unless he goes over there from a young age and lives there. Never. Never. Because the tracks are too tough. They're too difficult. The lifestyle is too difficult over there with their, their, their practice tracks. There's no way an American will ever make it over there unless he goes over there from a young age and, 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 and becomes Europe. Mm. It's plain and simple because these practice tracks, no way. Especially in Southern California, no way. No way. They Did will you, never prepare you for any GP ever, ever, ever put on the calendar. How, many, how much uh, GP experience did you have? Part of my <laughs> ignorance on that. Uh... I did two years GPs, uh, three three donations. Yeah, you know stuff like that. Yeah, so, I thought you'd yeah. done a couple seasons yeah. over there because y you are one hundred percent right. So Jed Beaton is a really good mate of mine, right? And he has mm -hmm. gone over yeah. to Europe, and I think he's one of the dudes that's done it really well. Like he's really embraced uh, Europe because what you said is so true. Like. It's really hard to go over there um, as an American or as an Australian, uh, quite similar cultures like um, in terms of just how we generally operate the language and shit like that. But to go over there, there's like this immersion that you have to do. You almost have to like give up everything that you thought you knew. Like you have to give up a lot of those attachments and embrace Europe because it's so different. It's so challenging and it, it's... The, the, you have to face so much more than like just motocross and it was crazy so we had Jed on the show like ages ago and we joked about um, I want to go to Lommel and do a 30 minute moto at Lo and just suffer like I'm not allowed to pull off yeah. and me and my yeah. mates Sam, just, <laughs> just to like show the av like how fucking hard that would be for the average human so anyway Jed yeah. puts up this uh, this video of him riding Lommel and like I just went dude you are such a fucking G. Like, it is so sick to see you just out there pounding out laps as just this beat as fuck Lommel. I was like, it's so sick to see that you're getting comfortable. Yeah. And he wrote back and he's like, I am not comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but he's just he's just embracing yeah, he, it because you know he I probably mean? had yeah. <laughs> yeah he probably had hurlings go by him at 10 seconds a lap you know faster so but no it's 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 true you know for me when i went to europe it wasn't a big deal it was easy for me because what i was what was i doing <clears throat> i was racing racing a motorcycle everything else didn't matter to me didn't give a shit where i lived didn't give a shit what was going on around me i was racing a motorcycle didn't matter where it was because dirt's dirt 
a race is a race, a starting gate's a starting gate. Mm. So that's what I could never figure out is how people struggled so much going over there. Oh, what's this, the tracks? No, the tracks is dirt. You just learn to ride it better. But what's happening is our, back in my day, the tracks weren't so pampered and, and manicured as they are now. So again, actually in my day, the tracks in America were way rougher than the tracks in Europe. Really? Now it's, a, it's, a, it's the other way around. Oh my God, they're so much more rough. So much more rough because they would never dig them up. They would never rip them. They wouldn't do anything. They'd just put water on it. And so they would have like a little bit of, <clears throat> a little bit of fluff and they wouldn't get super rough unless you went to the sand tracks. Then when I was over there, I was talking about preparation and this and that and about, you know, lines and things. And then they started digging them things up. And then now, then they have a track crew come out and now they made their tracks the way they are. And they're, <clears throat> you know, they're rougher than ours. But what I'm going to say is, it's not that the Europeans are faster than us, and it's not that the Americans are slower than the Europeans. The way the, Ameri- the Europeans have been faster than the Americans is when the conditions have gotten so tough that we don't know how to, that we don't have the skills to ride as fast as they do. That's mm. the only thing. You get what I'm saying? If the track, because both, both races that we went to the last two, three years have been muddy, and that's where they, that's where they, 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 they they're skilled at. When I worked, worked, worked for uh, Glenn Goldenhoff when I was in Holland, <clears throat> There's a couple of times I said, is this, this is normal? And he's like, oh yeah, this, you know, this is every day. You don't ride if you don't do it. We went to a track with zero degrees. It was fucking snowing. There was, I swear on three, three corners, there was probably two foot of water. The mm. sand was two foot deep. And there was t- 10 of the top uh, GP guys out there doing motos. You get what I'm saying? And they say, yeah, well, if, if, if you don't ride, you don't ride. This yeah. is normal for us. And so the, my, my, my favorite thing in Holland was a fucking seat heater because <laughs> it was so cold, you know? Yeah. And, but I saw that and I'm like, there's no way one American would have been out there that was an amateur or anything trying to make a pro, a pro career. Yeah. No. no. So what happened is if we've been, we've become, we've become domesticated here mm. with, with, uh, kind of the, <clears throat> with how we look at racing. If, if it rains here, they cancel it. You know, they this, they that. It's like you're not you're not setting these you're not setting riders up to be pros. You're mm-hmm. not setting riders up to make a living in it because once you get up there, they don't cancel shit like that. You know, and so just a, just a change. The times have changed. So I don't think you know that's happening. It's just that we've been in conditions that they're better in. If we had a dry, dry, dry track, well then it it, it would probably be the same because there's no way that you're saying hurlings and you're no way you're saying Geyser is faster than. Tomac, and there's no way you're saying Tomac's faster than them. Everybody's at the same level now. You know what I mean? Everybody's at the same level, but they ride motocross so much more than us. And mm. we ride supercross so much more than them. So we have become supercross skilled, and they're motocross skilled just by listening to bikes. If you listen to bikes when they're riding outdoors, our guys are so much more violent with the gas. You listen to Europeans, they're so much more gentle with gas. And where's that coming from? Supercross. Mm. always riding motocross you know what i'm saying and so that's where i think this transition that the europeans have gotten maybe a little bit more skilled outdoors or faster than us just because our our own our whole concern is on supercross mm. so over here more concerned if it's on supercross so oh they're faster than us oh they are they're better than us oh they are well then let's go ride supercross <laughs> you know what i'm saying yeah, <clears throat> so yeah. there's that comparison to me is just stupid it's really stupid you know it, it's it. I I say, is Cairoli faster than than um, Tomac, or is Roxon faster than you know Prado? Not a European against American. That, again, that's just stupidity. You yeah, know? yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't. I, I like to compare the riders, not where you live. Well, just because you live in Italy, you're going to be better than a guy in America, or just because you live in America, you're going to be better a guy in France. No, <laughs> no. You're just a better rider. <laughs> you know. But that's just. <clears throat> <clears throat> that's just the way you know kind of the sport looks at it they always have to have a compare you know like a yeah we're better than you instead of like no guys we're we're a whole big fucking family you know what i mean you have the same passion and the same desire and the same motivation and the same interest as i do but it doesn't matter that you live in zimbabwe and i live in america or that you only can get out of second gear and i can was one of the fastest it doesn't freaking matter man we love to ride a motorcycle mm. and that's what's that's the way i look at it you know so, so what was the yeah. what was the experience like with um with Colin Coldenhoff <laughs> because you want to talk about like a t- a technician like a really a guy that you can see in every moto that he's doing even when he's racing it 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 looks like that dude is focused on his technique. 
<clears throat> yeah, we worked uh, we worked uh, quite a bit on technique, you know, because the, the funny thing is, is that he contacted me through Instagram and just said, hey, man, I watch all your stuff, you know, da, da, da. Thank you so much for what you do. And I was like, wow, thank you. That means a lot coming from you. Hey, if you're ever interested in doing some work together, you know, I'd love to help you. Um, you know, I can come in there, find some couple things. And he said, 100%. Why don't you meet me in Italy, uh, in Spain next week and we'll start working? I said, okay. So I flew there and then we started the relationship that way. So I helped him quite a bit <clears throat> with his understanding of, of how, of, of bike and machine. Mm. It's a philosophy. It's a, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's physics. You know what I mean? And that's what, that's what I'm tr trying to teach the sport is the physics of man and machine. And I, I, I feel that I understand it better than anybody on earth motocross wise of man and machine and how it works and how these things go together and da, 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 da. And so he is that, he's that guy. He has that same mind as I do, you know, very technical, very analytical, uh, this and that. So when I talk to him and things, it makes sense to him, you know, mm. it makes sense to him. So then he puts that into his play. Also talked a lot about the mental side of it and the, and the focus side of it and the being present and all these different things. And how the mind can't keep up with how fast motocross is happening, you know, because it takes a quarter of a second to make every decision. So blah, blah, blah. And he just he's take he took that in with open arms, mm. open arms. But we just had the COVID, the covert thing hit. And then, uh, you know, that was it. And I didn't want to go to a race and have to wear a mask. So. So it's pretty much a case of when the student is ready, the teacher appears. When the student is ready, the master will appear. That's what it That's seems like. That's what it seems like with it, with a couple, <laughs> you know, saying. you know what I mean? Like ah. you've put yourself out there yeah. <clears throat> and, and you've been extremely vocal, um, about technique and you, you've given away so much free information that is just <clears throat> like mm -hmm. incredible information. And that just that in itself is just a huge service to the industry because man, honestly, like this is my little rant on technique for you. We um we did uh mm -hmm. we did a ride from Cairns to the tip of Australia. It's about a two thousand kilometer uh dirt bike ride. We rode out of my uncle's garage in Cairns and then ten days later we got back into his garage. And we went with uh so it was wow. me, my brother, my dad, and we can't we, like slept in the dirt the whole time. Fucking incredible. Um <clears throat> but so me and my brother wow. And my, my dad's been riding for fucking 45 years. I've been riding for, you know, nearly 30 <laughs> years. And uh, then same with my brother, whole life, right? So we go on this ride. Yeah. And uh, we're with a bunch of guys that have bought bikes for this ride, right? So they haven't ridden oh, wow. a lot. Uh -huh. Yeah. And it's like, a it's a it's no joke. And um, so we're riding and, uh, and me and my brother are at the front and we're riding. My brother's a lot better rider than me, by the way. Um, so we're at the mm -hmm. front kind of, kind of cruising along and the, the guys that were with us who've just bought these bikes, w we could see like we were going through these sand, deep sand four wheel drive tracks, like beach sand, you know, like so, at points you're paddling through it. It's like real legit off-road shit. And these guys had no fucking idea what to do. And for me, I took for granted <laughs> yeah. the fact that I just knew the basics of, of technique, but I wouldn't have said that I did before this. It was just, I just knew it and I, I knew it. And <clears throat> um, so then we started giving these guys tips. We we're like, hey, when you're in this deep sand, like you really need to get your weight back a bit. You can't be sitting on the front with the tank. Like that's fine in this certain turn, but in this turn, you can't really do that. And then mm -hmm. we're on this dirt, these uh, like wide open dirt roads. We're doing like 130, 140 kilometers an hour. And you're going on these dirt wow. roads and uh, it's like Baja, you know, you get into sort of Baja style sections and, um, and we're mm -hmm. saying to these boys like all right when you're on these flat turns like you need to be like pushing down and back on this peg that's almost going to be like a, a like a traction control for you so we sort of spent 10 days coaching these guys and again i'm not wow, a, i'm i'm not cool. i'm not ryan hughes but in terms of like i was giving my basic dirt bike advice that i'd learned through through all these years and to see the effect that it had on these guys experience in terms of not fuck making them faster like who gives a fuck about that but just in terms of them extracting the most out of their dirt bike experience they'd paid twelve thousand dollars for this bike they'd taken time off work and all of this shit to like do this trip 
and just these uh, this advice around how to ro- ride the motorcycle better and safely it give the expi- like them more of an experience they got more out of what they were doing and i really think that with the stuff that that you teach that's kind of at the core of it is like let's make it safe let's make it enjoyable understand what you're doing like then you can really because not everyone can be Caroli, not everybody can be Tomac. We've all got this like personal ceiling, but there is uh, a level of um, there's like a peak version of you, and you need the right information, you need the right training, you need the right coaching to hit your peak level. And I just don't think that the average person's like anywhere close to it. And I think that it can make the experience of riding dirt bikes just so fucking hard and so much harder than it has to be. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. So, you know, I teach a lot of vets and, and vets, they come to me and they want to learn and they know have the old style, you know, the hunch, the tuck butt, the flat, flat feet, all these things. And I said, that's old school, but that was never really, that style was never really taught also. Mm. No one taught flat foot, tuck your butt round your back. No one taught that. Where did, where does that come from? So I think I put my finger on it. <clears throat> Most people that learn how to ride a motorcycle don't know how to ride a motorcycle. No. So there's fear behind it. There's fear behind it. You get what I'm saying? They don't know how to ride a motorcycle, so there's fear behind it. So if there's fear in my mind, what's my butt going to do? What's my back going to do? I'm going to round up. I'm going to get into a fetal position. That's a scared position. So, and I'm going to ground myself to something too because I'm scared. Yeah. So you're going to put yourself flat footed. You're going to tuck your butt. You're going to round your back and do something the first time. Learn to do something the first time it takes 500 reps to coordinate the nervous system. Yeah. To re-coordinate the nervous system, it'll take 5,000 reps to reteach it. You get what I'm saying? So I think a lot of people come into this sport not knowing how to ride, and then that tuck butt, flat foot, round back comes in because that's a from that your body will follow your mind. You know what I mean? I've never seen someone relax with tight fists. I've never seen someone angry with loose hands. You know what I mean? Yeah, your hands yeah, and your yeah. arms are an extension of your mind. So when I watch people ride, I can see he's a thinker, he's a feeler, just by their arms. Because if they're tight arms, he's a thinker. If they're loose arms, he's a feeler. Because the mind is an extension. Your hands are an extension of your mind. So, mm. you know, saying that, that is one thing. So I teach these guys a new style because that style nobody ever taught. I just feel that it, it's a, it, a, it just comes naturally from us being a little bit tentative and scared doing something. Even though now we get comfortable doing it, we become faster doing it. We do it all the time. But that can that first way of doing it is now stuck in you you know it's almost like the first time you've learned something about a new subject that's stuck in you until you learn something else and sometimes it takes time to to erase that first teaching that first lesson that first way right yeah you know theologies philosophies religions all these different things so saying that so now these these vets come back after we work a couple times and they're like dude Thank you so much. You have made writing so much more fun for me. Yeah. I'm, I can be more creative. I can take lines that I didn't take. I don't get tired. <clears throat> I can do things that I didn't do. I'm faster than my friends now. Wow. Thank you so much. And the only thing that you did was teach me technique and you told me to slow down. Every time I teach somebody, I said, hey, I want you to ride at 75% today. I don't care if your wheels only leave one inch off the ground. I don't give a shit. Because what we're going to do is we're going to teach you how to be a better rider, safer rider, more educated rider. And then with time, what you want will come out. Mm. But you can't get what you want unless you change the way that your your approach, right? So, hold on, excuse me. And then, um, so that's a good thing. So that's probably what you realize is that these guys started having so much more fun because they were so much more relaxed, mm. more comfortable because of the teaching that you gave them. And so that's the whole thing is that it, there's a philosophy behind, you know, I mean, there's a physics behind man and machine. If the bike works one way, the body has to work the same. The first point of contact from bike to ground is the wheels. What comes from wheels? Suspension, softness, movement. I could have Ken Roxon's factory 450, but if I had worn out tires, I could ride a stock bike faster, mm. right? <clears throat> so, and then the suspension, if I don't have, if I didn't have suspension, I would never be able to ride that bike correctly or at all, or even ride motocross, okay? The bike is one, but it's two. It has a front end, it has a rear, and they work opposite. If yeah. we didn't have that separation, we wouldn't ride motocross. 
You get what I'm saying? So that, and all the weight on the motorcycle is down low. The more weight you put down low, the better the bike handles. The more weight you put up high, the higher, the, the more top heavy it is, slower it handles. That's why the highest point of a motorcycle is a cable. So now let's put a body on top of it. So if you put a body on top of it, <clears throat> the first point of contact from body to bike is your feet when you're standing on it, right? What comes from, what comes uh, from the track that goes into your, and what comes from the track that goes into the bike that goes into you, she meant with softness, just like the motorcycle. Mm. If you're not controlling the motorcycle with your feet, that's like having bald tires, right? If you're not unlocking your hips, then you have no separation from upper half and lower half of the body. So you aren't matching the bike. The bike has separation. You need to have separation. All the weight's down low, so you need to control the motorcycle at the lowest point possible from bike to ground, closest to the rear wheel. That's controlling 90% of the motorcycle that 90% of your crashes come from, mm. right? You need to unlock your hips because the bike has separation. You need to have separation. You can't have the bike do one thing and something on top of it working opposite. <clears throat> it's never going to work. It's never going to work. So... <clears throat> To that point, one guy that has not changed his technique in six years or more, Marvin Muskin, you see his results start to slowly fade, 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 right? And everybody's starting to go faster, faster. Did the bikes get faster? Did their training get better? Did their anything get better? No. What happened is their technique got better. And even Eli has said it. He said it to me in Colorado, and I just heard him on an interview and says, hey, from six to 10 or whatever is so much faster now. Why? Because mm. their technique got better. Not their bike, not their training, nothing. Their technique got better. Everybody's technique got better. Jason Anderson took his neck brakes off. His neck bra his, his technique got better. Justin Barsha got on a, he took his neck brace off. Um, <clears throat> he got, he got better technique. Okay. Everybody wants to say it's a gas gas. Yes. Maybe it works with him better, but he won on a Honda. He won on a Yamaha. The kid can win. The kid's fast. But what happened is his technique couldn't handle his speed consistently. Mm. He'd always get himself into a problem and cause an injury because of the, the, the faulty technique that he had from that neck brace. You understand? Now his technique can allow that aggressiveness. That technique can allow more consistent, aggressive riding and not get bound up and then affected by some little mistake or some unbalance. Mm. So the only person that has not changed their technique is Muskin. He still has that flat foot, knees in front of the shoulder, butt out, elbows down, kind of like a, a praying mantis. Is he a great rider? A fucking phenomenal rider. And I think he could have been a, even a better rider. Okay, but this questions me. You have a guy named Eldon that's supposed to be the great trainer. You haven't identified this? You still just kept trying to make his, uh, his lap times better? You have a company like KTM. You haven't identified this? You just kept trying to make his bike better? Look at it. The guy can't go through whoops, man. You get what I'm saying? And I'm not downing anybody. It's just plain and simple in front of us. Okay. Mm -hmm. The guy, the guy has not changed his technique. So that's why I feel that his results have slowed down a little bit. Okay. And everybody else has freed themselves up, taken braces off, worked on technique. They're on their toes. Their hips are out. Their back are straight. Their arms are loose. He has a, he has a completely different style than anybody out there. And I don't feel it's working anymore. And if you listen to the announcers a couple of times, they say he has to set up his bike. Absolutely. Perfect or he can't ride it. Why? Because mm -hmm. he's already starting off unbalanced. He's already starting out unbalanced. What, find a sport, find an activity, find a movement that's calling for you to have your flat foot, knees in front of your shoulders, and upper body in the back of the bike, and your elbows down. That's not the way the body's been designed. That's all I'm getting at, you know what I mean? Yeah, I didn't design yeah. the body, yeah. but I'm following how it works. Yeah. I didn't design the fucking bike, but I'm telling you how it works. And now I'm matching them both together, and I have a gift to be able to do that. And the way I have a big gift to be able to do that because I was blessed to have the gift to be able to ride a motorcycle like I can. And I was blessed to be able to have a gift to be able to teach like I can. You get what I'm saying? And hey, so this is where I can bridge that gap for people because I can feel it and I can explain it. And, and, and so those this is what I'm seeing with everybody. Oh, sorry, Ryan. <clears throat> the lag, sorry, it gets me a tiny bit. Um, yeah, those things aren't mutually exclusive for everybody. Like there's a, you know, the saying, those who can't do teach. Um, you know, Bill Belichick, I, I don't think he could throw a football that fucking far, but you know, you get these, you get these <laughs> yeah. rare people that come along every now and again that, you know, they, they can do 
the 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 art that they are trying to teach as well and i think it's very valuable when you get somebody like yourself that that can really dive into the nuance because you know you could probably ask um a guy like ando or and again this i'm just throwing names out there you know and he might not be able to tell Mm -hmm. you these Mm -hmm. exact nuances and and that's not his job but yeah you're right it is a gift to be a person that can do both yeah, I've, I've been blessed with the ability to be able to see uh, to see what's... I can walk into a room, I can walk into a situation and see exactly what's wrong and know how to fix it instantly. It's just mm. a, been, it's a gift. I, did, I didn't study for it. Fuck, I didn't work for it. I went to eighth grade, you know what I mean? So don't, I'm trying to be anybody. I just have a gift to be able to see these little things. So again, even with technique, you control the motorcycle at your feet. You're at the lowest point possible. You're one with the bike at the hips so you can have separation. You stabilize the bike in the core. Because if, again, your suspension's only good as your chassis allows. Just like the 1999 CR250. It didn't matter what suspension you put on it, that bike sucked because the chassis wouldn't allow suspension to work. Okay? So if you have a rounded back, if you have a tucked butt, if you have anything like that, your core shut off. Your chassis is weak. It has cracks in it. It has fresh, it has, it's stretched out. Okay, and your arms and your legs are attached to your chassis or to, to, to your core. You get what I'm saying? So your arms and your legs are only going to be a strong, fast, coordinated, and efficient as your core allows. Make sense? And then also you got to keep your back straight. That's back. That straight back allows that core to come out. And that straight posture, as you see, everybody now has a straight back. Mm. Nobody's hunching anymore. Okay, straight back. Better the better posture you have, the better strength, stability, coordination, and balance you have because you're starting out in a good position. Start out in a good position end up in a good position, start out in a bad position, end up in a bad position, no matter how big or small the mistake or bobble is. And then those four things, my feet, my hips, my back, my core should allow my arms to be loose. Cause there's yeah. only one way to flow around, flow on a motorcycle and that's with loose arms. And there's only one way to go fast consistently and that's with the flow. And then you always need to be looking ahead. You always need to be ahead of yourself because if you're ahead of yourself, you can keep constant momentum. It's not who's fast from point A to B or point A to Z or D. It's from point A to Z all the way around the track. So it's constant momentum. Then the last thing is you cannot think motocross. The mind cannot keep up with how fast motocross is happening. So if my mind is clicked in, but I'm riding this motorcycle and I'm thinking about you being in front of me and, uh, you know, and Tomac behind me so you're faster than us right now <clears throat> tomac being behind me Perfect. well or or what my me- what my mechanics thinking what my team manager's thinking what trophy i'm going to get how much money am i going to get da 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 well my physical side is riding the motorcycle but my mental emotional side is somewhere else around me in front of me behind me so that means i'm split and if i'm split from the physical and mental emotional well then i can only hope that my wheels are going to be where they're at and there's any teeny little bit of hope in me, because that's the other thing. On the other side of hope is fear. Mm. On the other side of coin of hope is fear. So that's when people go, oh, man, I hope, I hope. Well, you only t- just shown me how fearful you are, okay? So you hope that your wheel's gonna be there, then there's gonna be tension. Tension, hesitation, hesitation, mistakes, mistakes, crashes, crashes, lack of confidence, right? Because your mind's wandering all over the fucking place. So when you learn how to feel motocross, you learn how to feel the first point of contact, your wheels, your mm. feet, your hips, your hands, you learn how to feel those things. Well, now you're, cause thinking is future. Thinking is past. It's never now. Mm. It can't be feeling is never future. Feeling is never past. It's only right now. So when you can learn to feel these things that are happening right now in motocross, well, then you're going to relax. And if you relax, well, then you have trust, right? And if you have trust, well, then you have flow in all these things. And then that, that present moment of setting yourself up in this position is only setting up that next section. Mm. But if my mind is over here and I miss this, then I've missed them both. So the same thing with this guy I'm working with Supercross right now. <clears throat> I'm like, hey, stop thinking about the triple before you've come out of the corner. That corner is going to make that triple. Yeah. So you're so focused on the triple that you're fucking up your corner and you're coming out sideways or you're stopping in the middle of the corner. Let's make this corner clean and smooth. Then that triple will be what you want. But if you do not make this corner clean and smooth, you're missing them both. You went slow around the corner and you missed the obstacle. So that's why it's so important to focus on this present moment. And that is by feeling. Because once I feel, I can trust my wheels are going to be there. 
I trust, I relax, I relax, I flow, I flow, I have speed, I have speed, I have confidence, right? And that perfect position, that technique position of always being where I want to be or what I want to feel is always going to set me up for this next section. And then mm. that's going to be what I want. And then I want, then I want, then I want, then there you go. There's your flow. Because again, <clears throat> motocross is instinct, right? I've taught my body so much that it can do it on its own. Intuition that I don't have to think about it because I've done it so many times. It's gone. Mm. And then initiation. I put my body where the fuck I want to put this motorcycle, not react to what the motorcycle has done. And then I come to it. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, I fucking love you know, that. It's, it's instinct. Be instinct because I taught my body so many times I've done so many repetitions Init uh, intuition that I already know what to do before that guy even knows what he's doing mm. okay so I can ride behind a track and be behind you and know when you go here that your bike's going to be going over there so I already know I need to go over here that's initiation uh, um, you know intuition and yeah, then initiation yeah. is putting the bike putting your body where you want that bike to be. If I come in the corner, my elbow, my head, my body leans this way because I want my bike to go there. I don't come in the corner and all of a sudden <clears throat> my body goes this mm. way and I'm supposed to be going left. Well, now I'm reacting to the motorcycle. I'm Fuck, reacting I to the motorcycle. Right I'm behind now. it. I want to go rod right now, bro. <laughs> well, that's what I, that's what I want to do. I want to do another gypsy uh, podcast with you, but have you come out to my place and we I'm ride, we run, we go trail riding and dude, it's all straight from my door. I have... I have, I feel the best place in Southern California. I can shoot guns from my door. I can run out of there naked and nobody can see me. I have a motocross track, the baddest outdoor motocross track there is in Southern California, right next to my house. And I have trails that you, that you could ride for hundreds of miles right out my door. Dude, it's, it's epic. I'm coming. <laughs> it's epic. As soon yeah. as I, as soon as I can, yeah. I'm there. It's good. Um, I love yeah. that. <laughs> as soon as, I love that. As soon as you um, go there. Yeah, I love the initiation of putting your body where um, you want to go. Because so I, I've, I'm a fucking technique nerd at, at this point um, with motocross. Because for me, like there's a there's a lot of enjoyment there. Like it really fulfills like a, a kind of an obsessive part of my personality. And I think that I didn't really enjoy mm -hmm. motocross as much. Like I, I didn't even ride the whole time I lived in America. I was fucking surfing. Really? And nah, yeah, I just was like, I was working, oh, wow. I was filming. Yeah, I was filming every day. I was like, oh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to surf. Cause I, I'd kind of lost the, the want to go fast. Like I kind of just didn't give a fuck to go fast anymore <laughs> because I just didn't really see the point of it. But then when I started riding to improve my technique, it completely changed motocross for me in general. Cause now I don't care about going fast and I'm going faster than I ever went before just simply because I'm focusing on, on technique, but the, there's like this process that I can be involved in every single time that I ride that, that doesn't have any like ego involved in it. It doesn't have any of the kind of bullshit that comes with it that I kind of stopped liking um, about riding. And I think that it's such a great, like the conversations that we've kind of been able to have through the podcast um, I hope that that's doing a little bit to inspire people as well as to not, um, not to, I guess like add, I'm not really adding anything to the conversation in terms of technique, but the, the headspace around why just the average dude should try and have good technique because it will make the experience that you're after. Like you are chasing an experience when you're riding and it will make that experience better. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, that's all motocross is, again, a feeling. You're chasing a feeling. That's what I tell everybody. I go, look, <clears throat> when, I, when I teach them, I say, first, we have to feel it to identify that that's a better feeling and that's what we want. And once we I can identify something, I can recreate that all the time. Mm. But you can't recreate shit unless you identified it. And you can't identify anything until you feel it. And you mm. can't feel anything until you usually sh slow the fuck down. So let's slow down and learn, learn a new way. And again, that's the same thing. I was teaching this older guy and he kept going through the corners. Head would go this way. His head would go this way. And I'm like, dude, what is your issue? You know, and we did everything, everything. I said, all right, Bob, this is what we're going to do. We're just going to act like we know nothing about motocross. We're going to, mm. we're going to act like we know nothing and we're going to start from zero. We're going to, we're going to re, <clears throat> we're going to go about this a different way and this and that. And then something clicked in my head and I was like, Huh, that's kind of, 
I got to do the same thing. I got to have a different approach to my writing mm. because I was again stuck in that mind. That's that thought pattern of that. It should feel like this. I should expect this. I should go about it like this because I did that for so many fucking years. You know what I mean? But I'm not that guy anymore and I'll never be that guy. That guy's dead. So I have to go about it differently. And I just one day I said, you know, what? I'm just going to go dance out there, baby. I'm going to go dance. And oh my God, it was like, it was like I was reborn. Like I was born, I was like born again. My writing changed. My interest for it changed. Yeah. Uh, everything changed just because of the approach and the perspective I had of it because I was stuck in one way. And I forgot that I need to look at it a different way because I'm a different man now and I'm not, you know, I'm 48 years old. I'm not 28 anymore. And so if I want to enjoy motocross then I have to enjoy it a different way by just dancing on it, not trying to be fast at it. Mm. I think the, um, the, the Marvin thing's interesting. Like, do you think that if you Mm. worked with Marv, like what, what could you do? I know I just, I know I just screwed a lot of people. I'd be pissed off. (laughs) No, no, no. no. Uh, What could I do with him? Well, I could, I th- honestly man like i think there's no harm in saying that stuff like honestly fucking motocross is so <clears throat> precious dude like the, the you look at any other fucking sport in the world you've got these like expert analysts that will just like call it how they see it with the you're not being disrespectful to the guy you're not saying when you talk about marv not changing his technique there's no fucking malice in that there's no ulterior motive for you saying that like you're a guy you're you're the fucking nutty professor of motocross that is like knows his shit and is looking at it in a different <clears throat> way honestly if i'm fucking marvin and my results have been the way that they've been i'm fucking calling the doctor you know what I mean? I'm calling the nutty professor yeah. because what the fuck have you got to lose it, it, at this point? And that's the thing. And that's where this, everybody goes wrong. If they're struggling, what do they do? They go train harder. Mm. They try to change their training. They try to change their bike. They try to change this. No dude, there's a time that speed comes from technique. Yeah. Speed comes from technique. Endur- uh, fitness just creates, you know, you know, technique creates speed. Fitness just creates speed for a duration of time. You yeah. get what I'm saying? That's yeah. why Purcell was one of the fastest guys. That's why you see Josh Hansen just fucking kill people in, in practice. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. You, you, it's called technique because technique creates speed. Uh, fitness creates speed for duration of time. So they can train Marvin till he's fit as the fittest guy on earth. He's never getting faster. He will mm. never get faster from here on out. And he's missed the window because of the technique has changed. Okay. Anderson was struggling because he had a neck brace on. It was tucking his head, it was rounding his butt. And he was just over moving on that motorcycle. Now you see a different guy, a little bit more still. It's going to take time for this new style to start. It takes time to perfect change. Barsha, you're seeing a different, you're seeing a different Barsha now. Way more consistent, less mistakes, less wildness because his technique is allowing that to happen. Mm. Uh, Chase Sexton, he took his off. You're seeing, you're seeing somebody that if he didn't have these stupid little crashes, I think already won one or two races. I uh, 100% saying? agree. Okay. To, you know, Tomac took his off. You know, everybody's taking these braces off and stuff like that. That's creating better, better, uh, better positioning. And, uh, you know, everybody says, um, who was, who was I talking to? I was, I was, I was training some, a cop the other day, you know, just rides for fun. He goes, dude, you know what? He goes, man, what? he goes, I listened to what you said and I bought some knee pads and I went riding and then I took them off and then I went riding again with my knee braces and I was blown away by how tired my legs got in these things. Mm. And I said, well, there's your 10% that wise Cooper faster at the end of the races. Maybe that's a 10% more efficiency. Mm. 10% more efficiency is, is, is massive at the end of the races at that level. And maybe it's not 10. Okay. I'll give you five. I'll give you two and a half percent. Doesn't matter at that, I'll at give that you two. point. But yeah. two, 2%, if you can give me two more cent more speed, 2% more fitness, 2% anything at that end of that race, I'll eat, I'll You're eat, paying good shit. cash you know for that mean? shit. Yeah, paying good cash for that. So, you know, that's where I'm getting at is that the body has been designed one way and it's not to be braced. It's, it's meant to be efficient. And when mm. things are happening as fast and violently as motocross, well, you need to be as efficient as you possibly can. Because wherever you're tight, you're going to be affected. So that's why Marvin gets, he struggles in whoops because he rides flat footed. So he's affected from the first point of contact. Mm. Same with James Stewart, the best rider we've ever seen in the world, but he rode flat footed. And that's why he was always on a verge. And then boom, the bike would just spit into the outer space and be like, where did that come from? Because he rode flat footed. If Mm. he rode like Villapoto, 
you, I, I, I don't even have words for what we would have probably saw. I don't even have words what we would have saw if, if, if James Stewart rode with his feet like even his brother does, you know? Mm. So these are the things I'm seeing. It's wherever you're locked up, you're going to be affected. So Marvin's getting affected in his feet. He's getting affected in his hips. He's getting affected in his head. His elbows are down. There's no strength in it. So I'm not saying the guy's a bad rider. I'm just telling you that, I, like I said, I didn't design the body. Mm. Okay, and I can I can I can pick something from every single rider to make them a little bit better, and that's all I've wanted to do in this sport. I wanted people to come to me, let me fix you, and you go away. I don't want to wipe your ass, and I do not want to make a sandwich for you. Does yeah. that make sense? I want to <laughs> fix does. you, I want to teach you, I want to educate you, and then I want you to go away because I want to live my life. Yeah. And 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 that I don't want to I don't really care to train anybody unless they're a certain person. And I have yeah. one kid, and that that kid right now is all I care about training. Who, and, um, who are you training at the moment? Yeah, you, is it not knowledge or? Uh, I do. Uh, I've just been working with this kid, uh, Noah Vinny. Yeah. Little young kid. Young kid on an 80. He races with Deegan. And really exciting to me because I can take this kid and I can mold him. Mm. Not have to go to the top and have to be on their schedule. Have to be, have to deal with their ego. Have to not, you have to deal with their team. You know what I mean? And you yeah. can't do your work. And then a lot of times those guys up there are so stuck in their way yeah. or uh, so afraid of, so afraid of change that they won't. Or they've heard these things about me that da 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 and they're afraid to work with me. But yeah. nobody's ever really truly talked to me. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, is that is that and, like a and barrier that's just a bunch for you? Of hearsay. I think it's a barrier for me that people have some, some other idea of who I am or people, cause again, what story is good unless you've exaggerated a little bit. So I'm sure there's so many things that have been exaggerated about me. Like I've heard that I, I sleep fucking with, you know, a chain to a pole because I'm afraid of lightning. I'm like, that, you know, just weird, stupid stuff, but Hon people love honestly, just to make though, up stuff about, if you're the fucking you know, dude, people love to make up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, if you're a dude that has like earned a story of being chained to a pole because you're scared of lightning, you're probably a badass motherfucker. It's like that dude in uh, what was the Charlie Sheen movie, the baseball movie, the guy that had the fucking chicken. <laughs> yeah. he, he was like the yeah, biggest. Yeah, 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 yeah. Was, he was um, the biggest G of all time. Yeah. So if you you've earned yeah, that shit, that, uh, I would I would actually embrace that yeah, big, fucking shit. Big, was it? Big League was it Big yeah, League right? Yeah, that yeah, show, yeah. The movie Big League, yeah, I think yeah, so, yeah, maybe? yeah. Uh, it was something. It so, was something. So you know, like I just that. I'm just making something up, but you know, people also, you know, human beings are also afraid of change. Mm. So they know if they come to me, that I'm going to be changing them. I'm like, hey, take that shit off. What are you using that? What are you doing with that? I don't, I don't want your money. I don't need to put my arm around you to see that I'm working with some top writer. I was that. I was you. Yeah. You know what I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to teach you people. I want to teach you people. And so, you know, that's the thing. And, and, and people giving me shit, you know, t talking about bracing and all that. Well, it's logical thinking, man. It's logical thinking. Whatever you brace, you make weaker. Whatever you don't use, you lose. You know, whatever you brace, there's going to be a point where there's a weak point where it, bra you know, it, it has well, you its, spread its in the where, tension you know, to something somewhere else. else will break. Yeah. And then again, pretty much whatever you don't use, you lose. And then you're taking away so much mobility, so much more efficiency out of the body and that you can't deny it. That's what I'm saying is I, I challenge anybody. I tell anybody, I go, any brace company, any scientist, any, let's have a debate, man. Let's have a debate because what you're break, what you're making is after the crash, after the mistake is happening. Mm. What I'm talking about and what I'm focusing on is not making that mistake and crash happen by having perfect functional, you know, primal positioning technique on the motorcycle, not a position that is limited because of the fear of injury of what could happen after I, I crash. You understand? So, so, you're so I'm whole, putting these things on for. Sorry. So your whole uh, theory essentially is prevention is better than cure. This is that's literally like your philosophy around this in in a nutshell is that you prevent the crashes from happening instead of bracing for something that you're bracing for a future event. So prevention is better than cure in your mind. And by not wearing braces and by not having these things inhibiting your movement, you're actually going to prevent the things that you're bracing yourself for. Will you prevent them? No. Can you bring down that percentage? I believe a hundred percent because again, have I, have I, I broke both my legs under my knee brace. I tore an ACL with a knee brace on. 
but I compounded a femur without a knee brace on. I, I broke uh, T2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, was paralyzed twice. I didn't have a neck brace on. You get what I'm saying? But I know yeah. people that have neck braces on that, that broke T4 and they're paralyzed for life. So again, there's, there's no 100%. There's no 100% safety. You pick the sport, my friend. You pick the sport. You pick the most dangerous sport. And you're going to complain to me about talking to you and telling you and teaching you how to be efficient on this motorcycle because I have felt what it's fe- supposed to feel like to ride a motorcycle. Mm. Most people haven't. So just like this kid I was teaching this, the last couple of days in Supercross, his bars were kind of low. He's a tall guy. And I said, you just never knew you were uncomfortable. Yeah. You have no idea that you're uncomfortable right now. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, let's change these bars. Let's do this. Let's do this. We're going to ride outdoor for three, four days. We're going to do some trail riding and we're going to get this technique into you. He rode Supercross today. He's like, oh my God, like I told you, you didn't know you were uncomfortable. And now he goes, I cannot believe how good I feel. And, and this and that. So most people are riding so bad on mo- motorcycle. They just don't know they're uncomfortable because yeah. they don't know what riding a motorcycle correctly feels like. Okay. So again, when you, your knees at the knee point, you have 30 to 40 of interior and exterior rotation side to side. Right. And if you limit that, well, that's like taking 30 to 40% of any movement out of the motorcycle. Tell me how you're going to mm. ride that motorcycle. If anything that's supposed to move, isn't moving to its true potential, even just a little bit of play in your throttle, you're coming back. Yeah. Just so your forks are a little bit too hard. You, you make a click or two. The bikes are so sensitive to change. The bike is so sensitive to weight being in the wrong positions. That's why the most important thing in a motorcycle is have balance. So now if you put, let's say, yourself at 170, 80 pounds up at this high level in a wrong position, you don't think you're going to affect that bike when two clicks, two pounds, and two millimeters change the bike? And you mm. got 170 pounds, 60 pounds in wrong positions up here at this high level? You're going to completely manipulate the direction of the motorcycle. Is that what I'm saying? And so that's why I think it's, it's a physics thing. It's the bike has to work with the body as the body has to work with the bike as the, you know, as a, as the mind, you know, the mind and the feel have to work together because yes, you do have to think about things, but you also have to feel the things at the same time, mm. if that makes sense, you know? And so, you know, this, this is kind of a thing I'm getting at is just teaching people the right position you know, and, and, and getting away from these old ways we've been doing things, you know, there, there's no scientific research, so to speak on these neck braces. There's no scientific anything on this. They're, they're tested in a laboratory, which you're never going to resemble a crash, but you're wearing something for the hope for the maybe that you'll be okay after the crash that you have no control over, but it's Mm. putting you in such a dangerous uncoordinated, inefficient position before the crashes happen or mistake has happened that you made your, your mistakes to crashes instead of one in a hundred now one in 10 because of where you're starting out and on the bike. Mm. That's all I'm getting at. That's all I'm getting at. I'm not, I'm not going to ever talk to you after the crashes happen because I have no control of it, no control of it, but I have all the fucking control in the world at where I'm at before the crash happens. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And so yeah. many people in motocross are so concerned about what if, what could, what might, what they don't want to happen and what's happened in the past that they set up, they prepare for it. They yeah. come into a section, they come into a corner, they come into somewhere and they prepare for what they don't want. Hope and fear. Because it's happened a few times. So when you prepare for what you don't want, guess what you get? What you don't want, right? So when you, I always tell my guys and me, hey, always prepare for what you want. Be in that position to get exactly what you want. So if it does go wrong, at least you start out in the right position. Mm. Does that make sense? And so that comes from the same thing is you have to have a very bad memory to be a very, to be a good racer, meaning you can't bring the past into the present. Yeah. If it's happened once or twice, doesn't mean it's going to happen all the time. <clears throat> but if it's happened back then and you keep being in the past and the present, you're going to keep re- reliving the past. And that's what I feel has happened to myself and happened to Trey Kennard and happened to James Stewart is that we crashed so much that we started fearing just not crashing. Okay, just don't mm. crash. I just don't want to crash. I just don't want to get hurt. Just don't crash. Not that we're afraid of crashing, not that we're afraid of getting hurt, but fucking hey, just don't crash. Yeah. So what are we thinking about? Crashing. <clears throat> you get what I'm saying? And, that, and I saw that tendency in me. I saw that tendency in Kennard. And I saw that tendency in Stewart at the end of, the, of his career. Mm. You know, it's just almost like, almost you start riding almost too, te- a little bit tentative that you start making mistakes because you're, you're, you're almost riding slower than you should be. So mm. your reactions aren't as fast as they should be, so to speak. Or your mind's not as fast because you're stuck in this fear pattern. Yeah. You know, because you're yep. always going to back away if you have any kind of fear, stress, or, or, <clears throat> nervousness nervousness in you 
Yeah. And I always yeah. ask everybody, when you have your best races, what were you thinking about? And they're like, nothing. I said, exactly. You know, when the guys come run my trail, when we get done with my trail, I said, hey, what are you thinking about? They're like, dude, nothing. I was just trying to put my foot the right spot, not hit a cactus, you know, jump on this rock. I said, exactly. Yeah. You just trained like you race, you know? And so that's where a lot of people are going wrong in the sport too, is their training. Their training's too slow. It's, un, it's unproductive. Mm. You know, they're, they're riding bicycles down roads that, that, that a 12 pound bicycle down a road that, that is causing them to actually slow down because it's uncoordinating your, your core. It's yeah. putting you in bad positions. There's no, there's no impact. There's no kinetic energy being put into your joints. And also your mind can start wandering. Mm. Right? Because most people in motocross are putting their foot in a steel plank boot. So now their foot's asleep. Then they go to a bicycle, they put it in a carbon fiber plank, and then they put it, they get done with that and they put in big squishy shoes. So their feet have fallen asleep. Your foot is the most complex suspension system ever created, says Da Vinci. And yeah. he also said that mechanics will never recreate that, recreate that, that, that foot, which they haven't. And I worked with a billionaire guy in, um, in Aspen last year and we were talking, he's like, hey Ryan, do you know I own a uh, robotics company too? I'm like, oh, that's cool. And he goes, dude, he goes, you wouldn't believe the shit that we can do. That stuff that we, we have almost a human, but man, there's just one thing we can't create. And he goes, that's a foot. And I just went, wow. And so that's where everybody in motocross to me is going wrong is they're not, they're not training the first point of contact. And that's what I'm saying. Just like tires, tires are so, ex are so important in motocross that people don't realize it. Mm. So the first point of contact provides your feet and nobody's training those things. Everybody has dead feet, dead feet mean feet that aren't alive dead feet mean feet that aren't strong aren't stable and they have no feel to them right so you know for me i'm all about feet everything i do is about feet but that's why my balance is so good that's why my my power is so good and that's why things at 48 years old you know yeah. it's just the way that you live your life and uh you know i don't know why i went there but just <laughs> my my conversation went there <laughs> no, no 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 i fucking love that so. man so what are you what are you doing to train your feet because man like i completely completely agree i put shoes on my feet every day if i walk on fucking asphalt and it's like 11 p uh, 11 a.m in the morning i'm fucking on struggle street and it's like that's kind of some pussy shit yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, is that you have to train because there's a hundred different ligaments, joints, tendons, muscles in your feet. Like I say, yeah. it's the most complex part of the body, but it's never used. It, it, it goes to sleep. So once your feet are uncoordinated, then your core becomes uncoordinated. Yeah. So how do we train our feet? Well, we have to take our damn shoes off first because we weren't born with shoes and your feet are strong and they can build up callus. So, and then also you're taking away so much kinetic energy <clears throat> from your joints hitting the ground and also so much energy from the earth coming into your body from that grounding effect of putting your feet on the earth. You guys wouldn't believe the power that there is, there is in the earth when you stand barefoot on the ground, not on pavement, on dirt, and watch the sun come up in the morning. It's one of the most powerful things right there. And that is a new, that is a way to biohack the system mm. doing that every morning, every, every morning, you know, it's a way to biohack it because you're getting these, <clears throat> there's a red light that comes up for the first hour or so of, of, of sunrise. And that red light is just, it's healing in the eyes, you know what I mean? And the body. So that there also, um, you know, the shoes that I wear, you know, people want to uh, make fun of them. But then I had some friends come over, Victor Sheldon and his wife, you know, we yeah. went hiking on my trail and I said, Hey man, put these shoes on. They're like, Oh man, these funky shoes. They put them on. They're like, Hey, where do we buy these at? They're like, these things are amazing. Yeah. So what happens is it's just like you have a condom for your foot, so to speak, you know, mm. with the finger shoes, but now your whole foot's moving. People that run my trail, they can't barely run my trail until they put their finger shoes on. They're like, oh my God, I can climb these hills. I can jump on rocks because now you're using your feet like, like hands. They're supposed mm -hmm. to be, you get what I'm saying? There, my foot pegs, I have Rhino equipment foot pegs. And it's the only piece of equipment that's ever been designed asking you to balance on the balls of your feet. It's the only equipment you can look. So can you explain Indoor that? Indoor Swiss what, what, ball, what are they? Busu ball. Uh, they're foot pegs, you know, they're foot pegs I made from Rhino equipment. So you can, I don't know if you have a computer, but you can bring them up and they're foot pegs like this. And then you can click your handlebars to them too. So yep. their foot peg, there's a rubber spring. We have a, we have a patent on it. So there's a, there's a hundred, there's a hundred percent mobility. There's a 360 degree mobility at, at a hundred percent of the time. 
because yep. it's on a rubber spring. So you're moving around like that, but you're on the balls of your feet. So the reason I came up with this is that I was in the gym and I was looking, you know, I had my gym in my house. I had my Swiss ball, my Busu board, all these things. And I'm looking at it. Then I'm looking at my motorcycle, and my bicycle. And I'm like, well, why am I training full foot when I only use two and a half inches of my foot? Mm. So I got some foot pegs and I put them down and I did some things and I'm like, I got an idea. And we did that and I said, I had to check the internet and make sure nobody had anything. And I was blown away that nobody's ever made anything to ask you to balance on the balls of your feet. When every activity and every sport and every movement comes from that point. And so I created these things and then you wouldn't believe the, the instability that it puts in your joints. You know what mm. I mean? So that there alone with 360 degree movement at 100% of the time will put it so much will put so much stress in your ankles and your knees and your hips and your core, not by tiring you out, but just that, that, in, that, that, uh, instability, you know, the, the nervous system. Yeah. 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 Then the nervous system, it'll, it'll challenge it. It'll make it stronger make it more coordinated. So those are the best ways to start uh, doing that again, riding on, um, you know, riding on your, on your balls, of your feet when you're riding a motorcycle. Cause again, every sport you do is on the balls of your feet. The only thing that you do flat footed is watch everybody play sports. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. So what definitely. the fuck are you doing it on a motorcycle, you know? And and everything that you do, f everything that you do functionally at the gym, as a kid in the playground, or wherever, working in the house, whatever, you're going to do functionally, but then everybody does it differently on a motorcycle, you know? And that's where we go back to that fear part. Mm. Everybody's preparing for what they don't want, you know? Everybody's preparing so, for what they don't want. If you have this, If you have this much fear in you, then why the fuck are you riding this sport? Mm. All you people that want to hound me on Instagram about me teaching you guys and telling you functional movement and, and primal movement and how the body works. If you're so f afraid of getting hurt, then why in the hell are you riding this motorcycle? Why are you doing this sport? Why? You're fooling yourself. You're absolutely fooling yourself, you know? And so for me, I don't have, I don't, I'm not, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't, uh, born with a lot of fear you know what i mean mm. and so i guess it's easy for me but you know i, I just don't get people how you know they they want to they want to <clears throat> they want to bash me for something that i didn't create and that is functional you know what i mean what, what's the criticism strange that to me. you get like like well they they, they you know they're just stupid people. oh fuck well now i guess we just don't wear helmets you know we ride with flip-flops and uh, we do that you know just like mm. you know they just these stupid, these stupid things that people just don't go, huh? Well, that makes sense, or nah, it does. I don't know if that. Yeah, that makes sense, but you know, it wouldn't be for me. And mm. Leave it there. You know what I mean? Instead of just put three hundred comments on my my Instagram, you know, just battling each other over this and this and this. But I just laugh because it. I always, I always come out on top because nothing mm. I'm saying is is pulling out my ass. You know, just wait, just give it a couple years. You watch. Okay, Glenn Goldenhoff, he doesn't wear them. Cooper Webb, he doesn't wear them. Uh, there's a few other guys, and there's a lot of kids coming up that aren't wearing them now. You know what I mean? A lot of what, kids. What's because the again? We just got taught. We got taught. We got taught that we had to have these things. Mm. We got scared by David Bailey that we had to have this, or we would get paralyzed. <laughs> Come on, you know what I mean? These yeah. are what got shoved down our throat with no testing, no anything. And it's not even with the, how the body works. Yeah. So, you know, this is where the sport does. It's a lot of the decisions based in this motor is this sport is based off fear. Yeah. Right. It's based off fear of what I don't want. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's completely that, incorrect when there's such a consequence on the other end. You yeah. Know? So what, what are the knee, the knee pads that you wear? Cause I'm going to go buy some literally right after this podcast. <laughs> Well, I don't know if I need to keep promoting them because I don't make any money off them and I've sold probably six, 700 pair of them, you know, so I'm not the best businessman that way. No, uh, just the EVS just, uh, uh, TP 199s. Yeah, no, I, Travis. I can give two shits. I already told, I, I already told Travis, I said, dude, you, I, I text him. I said, man, have you, has your checks been getting bigger? You need to owe me a little, uh, a little bonus here. <laughs> old, old Trav, he's good for it too. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. He's a good dude. I like that. <laughs> Um, so, so who, and again, and, and I'm not, and, and I'm not, and I'm not trying let me get this. I'm not trying to yeah. bash any companies. I'm not trying to bash anything. I'm not trying to anything. I'm just, I'm just showing you an, on, on the other side of the hill. 
yeah. that there's, there's, there's maybe it's sunnier over here or there's, there's, there's some better fruit over here. That's all I'm doing. Nobody in this sport ever talks about what people don't want to talk about. Mm. Nobody talks about these neck braces. Nobody talks about the this. Nobody talks about you know that. Nobody wants to this because everybody's trying to protect themselves. Mm. Everybody's trying to protect their image. Everybody's trying to protect their persona. Everybody's trying to protect their little sponsor that they have. Everybody's trying to protect that little bit of money that they're getting. I don't want sponsors. I don't care to have sponsors because I want to tell you the fucking truth. And mm-hmm. I don't want to have to hide behind this can or this check or this whatever or to, 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 and, and lie to you. Mm-hmm. That's one thing you'll never hear from me is a fucking lie. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't matter how much money I have to put down <clears throat> or how much money that uh, I don't get from telling mm-hmm. you the truth. Because this sport, I was blessed to be able to ride a motorcycle like I have been. Okay, I've been blessed to be able to have a passion and an interest that has kept me involved in something for, for 37 years. Mm. I've been blessed to have an ability to coach and teach and see something and dissect something and explain something like most can't in the sport. So am I supposed to put a cover on that and charge everybody for that or give them for free since I was blessed with it? Mm. I feel I give it to free because I was blessed with it. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah, a blessing. Yeah. It was a fucking gift. So why not give it to everybody else? I wouldn't, I, who am I to charge for that? Mm. <laughs> you know, if I worked, if I went to a school, if I did this and I studied and studied and studied and studied and studied and studied and didn't even like the subject and, but became yeah. good at it and then taught it. Well, yeah, give me some freaking money, man. But I was born and blessed to be able to do this sport and teach a sport like most couldn't. So it's a gift. So here's my gift to everybody. Yeah, I mean, give it and back, that that that'd not, be a lot of fulfillment. Everybody. There'd be a lot of fulfillment in living the life that the way you do with that philosophy behind it, though, right? And you can't put a price on. Like, there's a hundred percent fulfillment. No, there's a hundred percent fulfillment on it. Just like if you lost the last few words of uh, of um, of Bill Gates, not Bill Gates, um, I Apple guy. Damn it, just thought of oh, Steve name. Jobs. The guy that died. Um, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, sorry. Yeah. Steve Jobs talking about, hey, it doesn't matter if you have a $150,000 car or a $100 car, you get to the same place, you know, the same way type of thing. And so that's the thing is that, you know, it's very fulfilling when you can give to somebody without having the result mm. before it. Mm. So that's the thing is if, if, you're go, if you're working and you're working and your first concern is a result, you're all probably only going to be you're only going to be able to give half of yourself, so to speak. You're going to be missing a lot. You're not going to be fully present. The biggest mm-hmm. thing that coaching is being is being engaged in the coaching and then letting the result come out itself. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So too many people get focused on what they're going to make from it and they're not focused on what they're teaching. Mm-hmm. You know, focus on your teaching and let the result happen. It's the same in racing. Everybody, same in racing. Everybody goes practicing four times a week. And the, and, the, and the idea is to, to be fast, to be smooth, and I love what I'm doing, right? I, I'm going to the track because I love what I do, and I'm going to be fast, smooth, and I'm going to go and ride as best I can. Then they get to the race on the weekend, and now there's a have to, got to, need to. I have to do this. I got to beat this guy. I need to be, you know, fast or whatever. So now you just put all this pressure on yourself. You, t- you took away the action of it. Mm. Does that make sense? You took away the action of riding the motorcycle and you put yourself at the end of the race with this result of I have to, I got to, I need to get this position. But then you forgot about all these little things that make these things happen. But during practice, you're focusing on all these little things that make speed happen because there's no result. There's no expectation. Mm. Right. So with my coaching, I do the same thing. I don't have a result. I don't have an expectation. I just coach. Mm. So when you go practice, you just ride. But when you go to the race, now you change your, your, your thinking, you know what I mean? You put a result on yourself and that's why most people are better practicers than they are racers. Mm. So you should go to the race with the same idea and just, and just ride as clean, as fast, as smooth as you can. Well, what position you need to get today? I don't know. Don't care. Mm. That's at the end of the race. There's so many little things that happen before that result happens that most people are coming to the race and already at the end of the race before they even kickstart their bike. Does that make mm. sense? They're already at, I got to get first, I got to get third, hopefully I get fifth, you know, hopefully I get top 10, hopefully I qualify. 
that's the end of the race. What about your start? What about the turn? What about the this? What about that? What about loose arms? What about looking ahead? What about breathing? You know, those are the things that are going to get you your, your result. But mm. if my mind is so focused on the money I'm making on my, at the end of the day, then I'm going to miss all these little things that little Johnny and Billy are doing. And that, that's the, my perspective. You know, I try to yeah. never focus on the result of it. So focus on the action of it. So who is doing it the best <clears throat> right now? in your mind, in the professional uh, realm of racing a dirt bike? <clears throat> Technique wise, I will go with, um, I go with a, a Jet Lawrence. Yep. A Roxon, but Roxon's wrist guards to me affect him a little bit. As you can see, when you watch him ride, it's a little bit of this. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Watch, watch some of his races and you'll see this happen, right? because that's what's happening, it's hitting here. And so when his mm. wrist when his wrist goes to this point and it can't go down any farther, then this is gonna push this down. When he gets in some tricky sections with, when he gets into a battle with uh, Cooper, you see kind of him get affected more, mm. right? When things are happening super quick. But when he can ride smooth and clean, then man, he's, he's awesome. But when things are happening a little bit faster, I see him get a little bit more affected from from that, you know what I mean? So mm. I'd say I put him in there with a the technique. Christian Craig, of course, with a technique. Uh, head wise, I would definitely put, um, you know, Cooper Webb. Um, I definitely put him with the, the most mental strength. Uh, fitness wise, I will put Tomac. Mm. I just think that if, when it comes down to brutal, brutal, you know, times, and I believe it's can from where he most. lives, you know, I think a lot of people. <clears throat> I just believe people are making mistakes living in at sea level when this, this sport's called a, a cardio sport, so to speak. Yeah. And most elite athletes live at altitude. Mm. <laughs> so I feel that's where he gets his benefit from at living at 8,500 feet. Because mm. if anybody's ever spent a few weeks up at 8,500 feet and come down to sea level, you are a monster, dude. Mm. You are a monster. So his view, you know, he, he has more red blood cells, more oxygen, da, da, da. So that's, that's the thing. But, um, you know, he is getting up there with age. He's been, you know, it, it's the sport He's wears you down. hammering it out a while. Wears you down. Yeah. There's a, a lot of young kids. Yeah, a lot of young kids. There's a lot of kids that have changed their ways. There's a lot of kids that have, uh, writers done this and that. So you're not going to always be that that uh, dominant guy, you know? So, yeah, it's it's interesting that you said so that about, you know, um, oh, sorry, Ron. Uh, it's interesting you said that about Kenny because there was the, the last round, um, he was obviously in a pretty tight battle with Coop and, there was a uh when he was in the thick of that battle the whoop section the camera was actually side on in the whoop section and filming the dudes mm. pretty much go perfectly mm. side on and you could actually see kenny's uh attack position break down over the race and there was uh right when he was mm -hmm. like really in the thick of that battle with coop the attack position that he had through those whoops uh degenerated uh quite significantly and uh, yeah, to to hear you make that point about the wrist braces, that's actually quite interesting. I'd never, yeah. I forgot the dude was even wearing them. Yeah, we well, wrist bra you know, wrist braces and knee braces. And again, if you anytime, so if my knees, if I have thirty to forty percent of, if you know, mobility in my knees, and I and without knee braces, and my body is allowed to go this way efficiently right back and forth and stay with the bikes the bike staying underneath me well if i'm locked up my knees are locked up well now i'm only bending at the hips so now i counterbalance the bike and this next supercross i want everybody to fucking watch every corner and watch how smooth cooper is and how inside he can go on mm. these some of these corners and i feel that is because he's just a teeny teeny bit more efficient with his knees because his knees will move more than with a neck with a knee brace and you can see it you watch him go through a corner and there's just a teeny 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 little pause or hesitant or the body going the other direction with the other riders yeah. okay and that teeny 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 is that two hundredths a second yeah 200 of a second wow he's 200 of a second faster than me fuck man by five laps these are two seconds faster he's two seconds ahead of me that's a lot yeah. in supercross but it's nothing you know what i mean it's nothing yeah. and you where did he where did he pass uh Roxon last time very inside yeah you know so this is what i'm seeing over the jumps and things like that because you, you can't deny it it's it's <laughs> you can't deny it when you stiffen the body up it's going to work more when you stiffen the body up, you're going to limit it. 
Mm. You, I don't know how nobody can understand this. I don't know how nobody can see this. You, know, you understand? What sport on earth wears braces? None. None. Unless they have some injury. You know, yeah. ski racing, the hardest sport on knees that I believe. None of them wear Dude, you're so right. Olympic skiing, downhill skiing, fucking hockey, moguls hockey, and shit. Hockey. Hockey. No, yeah. no knee braces. Okay, let's go to let's go to rugby. Let me see those guys wear a neck brace and knee braces. Let me see how they work. The Impossible. NFL. Impossible. NBA. Impossible. No, nothing. Because you're locking your head up. And when you lock your head up at the high level, you're affected. You have to be like a tree. You have to have strong roots. You have to have a strong trunk, which is your legs, and stability in your core where it moves, but then you have to be very loose from the kind of the tits up. And that's like a tree. It's strong at the bottom. It has mobility in the middle. And then it has, you know, stability in the middle, keep it there, but it also allow movement. But then at the top, it's very loose to withstand whatever direction that wind's coming from. So the same thing, I need to control the bike with my feet, be one with it at my hips, stabilize it and balance it through my core and my back. And that will allow my arms to be loose and my head to move with my body. But if my head is locked up here, that's like turning the tree upside down and you're going to have more movement. You're always going to be counterbalancing yourself. Whatever my head goes this way and hits this, it's going to exaggerate that movement as you see things with Marvin. <clears throat> when I go over the bars, I can't tuck my head, so now I'm a lawn dart. When I go over the bars, I can't get back. It's pushing my head down, and that's how you exaggerate everything. How do you initiate a front flip? By tucking your head. Mm. So if this is pushing your head forward, you're initiating that frontward direction, and that will have you have tight arms. If that makes sense? If your head's always kind of getting pushed forward from this thing getting pushed on your, in your head. You know, and then the thing that I see is people still wearing these old braces, these old neck braces. The first neck brace that came out was the most dangerous thing that's ever come out in motocross history. It, it, a carbon fiber strut that has no movement on it. That's two inches wide. That's resting on your spine. <laughs> what you're supposed to be tech protecting. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> and everybody fell for it. Everybody fell for it. That is why fear is what mm. I'm talking about. Fear, a carbon fiber strut that has no movement on it, resting on what you're trying to protect your spine. <laughs> you can't tuck your head. You got to play it against your head. So every time that you go over the bars, it pushes your head, you know, you go forward, it pushes your head forward. You have this big plate sticking out. So now when you flip on the ground, you have something else to stick on the ground. Mm. Right? You have something else to get stuck somewhere. You don't want shit flying off you. <clears throat> it's just like the GoPro. You're an absolute idiot if you have a GoPro on your head. An mm. absolute idiot. Why is our head round so it can skin on the ground? Why can we... This is our box. To tuck and roll. Go to jiu-jitsu. What do they teach you how to do first? Tuck and roll. Go to gymnastics. What do they teach you how to do first? Tuck and roll. So if you put a GoPro on there, now you have this thing that's going to stop movement on your head. And that's where you start. That's where you can break that neck or stop that head from moving or doing its natural motion by skidding on the ground. Mm. Right. We're not supposed to be stopped. Have you ever seen somebody get knocked out and roll down a jump? It looked like he just got 14 more joints, didn't he? He became yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. loose. Yeah. It was unbelievable. Yeah. It's unbelievable. That's why a drunk driver mostly always lives because he's yeah. so loose. He's so relaxed. Yeah. A stiff person is always going to break. A stiff person's always going to be affected. You get what I'm saying? So yeah. this is my whole thing behind it is you're stiffening yourself up. You're limiting yourself. You're causing more problems that don't need to be there. You're putting something on you for this one in a billion chance. One in a billion. You know what I'm saying? And so, but you're, but you're, you're causing all these, these, these imbalances in the, in, in the approach and the technique and, and all that. So again, you know, I don't know why we talked about that, but yeah. No, 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 no. It's good. I, honestly, like, I think it's really cool for people to just like genuinely hear the philosophies. <clears throat> um, and, and a lot of, I mean, I know from doing the, the podcast um, for as long as I've been doing it, like sometimes just the chance to just openly talk, you can express these <clears throat> ideas um, in such a great way. And j honestly, like your analogy of the tree is brilliant. Like you've got these strong roots and you've got this strong foundation and then there is some movement in the trunk, but that's a very stable, like that is the core of the tree. And then an individual leaf, man, you just 
touch an individual leaf it's there's no resistance and that can be from a tree that is just so <laughs> deeply embedded in the ground but there is that fluidity and and that um and that movement and so that's, that's i mean yeah and and so to just fucking go on the go on well, the ramp that you it? want to go on you know because there's so there's there's like beauty <laughs> in that shit like you can really because that's yeah. the thing about being a, a teacher as well is that you know we use these analogies and these concepts to try and um transform information that in your head makes so much sense but it's gotta mm -hmm. you know you've got to find these multiple vehicles to, to deliver that to these different people yeah yeah exactly that's and that's finding you know analogies and usually i'm pretty good at that and if i teach somebody i always ask them <clears throat> excuse me what sport did they do what sport have they done or whatever then i can go oh you did that okay well then i can just i can translate it to the exact sport they're doing and they're like oh right okay so okay now go be the hockey player go be the mm -hmm. skateboarder go be the, the surfer because it's all the same man it's yeah. all the same because everybody that comes to me is like dude i surf and i skate and what you're talking about exactly i'm like yes Dude. I didn't create the body, everybody. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. It's, it's plain and simple. The body is strong, stable, coordinated, and efficient in one position. Okay. Can you see me here? Yeah. And move this chair a little bit. Okay. So if you can see me, you put a bicycle here. This is my position, right? Here's a bicycle. You put a horse. You put a motorcycle. You put yeah. a baseball bat. You put a golf club. You put a weight bar. You put yeah. a football. <laughs> the body hasn't changed you get what i'm saying the body hasn't changed so that's that's what i'm getting at is that uh i'm just teaching you a functional primal position can and i you, give you, you, you uh, can't deny it can i can i give you uh, a a bit of info that you you might be able to take uh take with you as well so i do jiu-jitsu i've done jiu-jitsu for about four years i do it like real seriously i train every single day okay. like it, it's a it's a real serious awesome. uh part of my life and uh i so a couple of weeks ago i was lucky enough to train with a guy named levi jones leary and he's one of the best in the world he's an australian kid moved to new york wow. spent his whole he's literally done ten thousand hours of jiu-jitsu <laughs> And, uh, so, so it just made you look stupid. <laughs> oh yeah. Not even, it's yeah, not even close. Like it, it's like <laughs> me doing a moto with James, you know what I mean? Like it was that big of a difference. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but so we're, we're doing, we're training, uh, we spent about an hour rolling together and then, um, afterwards we're sort of just talking about different things that come up during the roll. And I was like, what about this? What about this? He's like, dude, your posture on top is just wrong. Like if you do this, this, and this with your posture, like you're going to be so much more stable. You're going to have so much more mobility. You're going to be able to put so much more weight into me. Do you know what he told me? Turn your toes in. Hmm. Hips out. Turn your toes in, mm -hmm. hips out, straight back. Yep. <clears throat> exactly. And so that's, that's from in the best and what is jiu -jitsu? jiu jitsu dude in the world. Thank you very much. And what's the X factor in, in golf? Hips out because mm. you have to have that rotation yeah. so anytime that you so again anytime that you straighten your back you just got so much more mobility out of there because remember every vertebrae has movement in it yeah you understand just like a tree every vertebrae has movement in it but if you're hunched and rounded no vertebrae has movement in it okay mm. when you bring yourself up your core comes into play now you have stability, so when that guy's trying to yank you here, yank you there, you got stability here instead of trying to just do it with your little skinny arm. Yeah. Okay? Then when you rotate your hips out, you have that rotation factor from upper and lower, right? So you have that rotation factor. So in Jiu Jitsu, I'd imagine that you could get way in different positions with your back straight and your hips out or be so much stronger yeah. in a position because that yeah. is that you know, that, that functional position, that strong position, you're going to be able to get so much more. And I'd imagine in jujitsu, it's not about strength, is it? No. With the, what that kid knew, what the, what that kid knew, he could probably be 15 times weaker than you and still put you on the ground just because of his technique. Well, we're, we're the same, we're the same size yeah. and he felt like okay, a but I'm fucking saying monster. He's, he, yeah. But what I'm saying is he could have probably been 50 pounds lighter and still did that. Yeah. The strength didn't matter. Technique. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're the same. We're the same yeah. size, it's and like, he felt he felt like a house on top of me. Yeah. So what I get at is, let's look at this, <clears throat> McGrath, technician. Mm. Um, you know, okay. What, what I go to? No, there's more of this. Sorry, more this way. This is what I always tell everybody. McGrath, a feeler. 
right? Stefan Everts, a feeler. Carmichael, a feeler. Jimmy Johnson, a feeler. Sebastian Loeb, a feeler. Michael mm. Schumacher, a feeler. Well, now we got to say, now we got to say uh, Lewis Hamilton. Lewis Hamilton, a feeler. You know what I mean? Valentino Rossi, a feeler. Mark Marquez, a feeler. Let's, they, some of them have done it in different ways. Like a, a Carmichael raced every inch of the track where McGrath was like a surgeon on the track. Mm. Um, Stefan Everts felt every inch of the track. You get what I'm saying? Like, like Valentino Rossi and this and that. So all the best racers of all the best racers are feelers. You get what I'm saying? Because if, if you took all those guys and set them up in a row here, McGrath, you had um, you know, Carmichael, these guys that were all the best of their sport, and you took their shirts off, you wouldn't think that they would be who mm. they are. You get what I'm saying? If you said, okay, line them all up and go, are these guys athletes? I guarantee you'd say, no, nah, no. Nah. So there's nothing physical that's, that's happening that's better than me or anybody else. It's something mentally that they're doing or not doing or something that they're feeling or not feeling that they have us beat. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It's not a physical thing. It's not we have like LeBron James sitting up there. If LeBron James was sitting up there and you say, hey, which one's the athlete? Oh, duh, right there. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that guy. But if you got Carmichael, McGrath, and these guys standing there, you would go, mm, I don't know. Valentino so Rossi looks like a It's not really a physical style. thing. It, yeah, he looks like a mosquito, you know, like yeah. a little mosquito. So yeah. that's what I'm getting at with people is that it's not such sometimes a fitness thing because not any one of those was McGrath a fitness guy. Nah. Carmichael. <laughs> no, he, he, he did train, but he wasn't that, you know, his numbers weren't that great. So yeah, you know yeah. I'm saying he wasn't a fitness guy, so to speak. Valentino Rossi. No, you know, down the road. And so that's what I'm saying. It's not such a physical thing to be great at a motorsports. It's a feeling. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a relationship. Like an air Senna was talking. It's a yeah. relationship. It's almost like a relationship with, with like what he would say with, with God, because he would get into such, he would get into such present moments that he said he'd experience the, the feeling of God. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? And yeah. so that is damn powerful. If somebody like Ayrton Senna in a wet race in Monaco said that he experienced God in a race because he was so presently focused. And that is where that comes from. And I talked to Carmichael one time at a rally rate, rally school that I was doing with Ken Block. And I asked him, I said, I bumped him and I said, Hey dude. And I go, I know what your secret was. And he goes, because how does someone like that win? He never, he never lost a championship mm. 10 years straight. A decade, never lost an outdoor championship. That's incredible, okay? So there's something special there. So I said, I know what your gift was. And he says, yeah, what? And I said, you were present when you were riding. Mm. You weren't a corner ahead, a corner behind, a lap ahead, a lap behind. You raced every inch of that fucking track, dude. And he goes, well, whatever that word means. He goes, you're right. He goes, I knew what my, he goes, I knew what my bike was going to do before I even hit a bump. He goes, I used to have such good feel with my front wheel, I could feel rocks. And he goes, you know what? By the way, he goes, I still can smell the dirt of my last race. So that's telling you something, you know, that's telling mm. you something. That's there's, he took away that, he took away, it's almost like having the ego. The ego is almost just like a little veil of dust. And once you can kind of flip away that dust, that ego kind of floats away. It's almost like he had that little bit of dust that holds us back, gone. And like he he felt or experienced something that we didn't because again, dude, you, you, I can't explain it. Well, we're two get, uh, so seasons you, that were undefeated, you know? Go yeah. Ahead, sorry. Have you, have you ever looked or like done any research into any kind of like philosophy around like non-duality <clears> and <throat> that there is no self at the center of experience? Like, have you ever like that sort of, that's kind of the undertone of like Buddhism and Zen and the Tao and all of these, because mm -hmm. what, what you're explaining and what you've explained for um, this podcast is, and, and I could text you some videos of me talking about this with some people yeah. where, um, where I've said that that feeling that you get. Um, so 
I, I spend a ton of time um, with like meditation and studying some philosophies around the concept of like non-duality. Um, a lot of a lot of Buddhism uh, stuff is is a lot of what I'll spend a lot of time uh, reading. Uh, but there's a lot of these guys now that have broken down this Eastern philosophy in more of like a neuroscientific way, more of like a Western way that doesn't have any of the traditions around it, any of the ritualization around it. Um, it the theology has been completely removed. And what you're left with is that the self is just this process within um, the experience of you being like a conscious human. And so the, the, mm -hmm. the feeling of flow you know, that's like the, you hear people talk about like flow states and this and that. So there's, there's these different types of flow that you can have. So there's absorbed flow, which is uh, what you would, what you describe when, when you say Carmichael could feel a rock hit his front tire. That's absorbed flow. That's so in the present moment and there's no, so essentially like what all these Buddhism and stuff, they'll say that the, the self is, is you explaining your experience. So the conversation that you have in your head about your experience, that's the self. So when you, you'll have Buddhism and all these kind of philosophies, they'll say there is no self. The self is illusory. It doesn't mean, that's not to say that like you don't exist. You're not having a conscious experience. Yeah. But what it's saying is that the, the self is just this conversation that you're having it's explaining the experience it's adding context to the experience it's adding concepts around the experience oh, i am on a motorcycle i am a motorcycle rider so those uh that is like the fingerprint of the self and so when you're in a flow state you're not experiencing a self there's no ryan hughes that uh, has financial trouble that is hungry that is tired that is upset that has a feeling there's there's no like affect that is uh painting or coloring your experience everything is removed and i and i really think that you get into these flow states like uh when a skateboarder lands a trick you've got a 10 stair gap and you've got to put everything out of your mind your focus on the present moment you don't like you can't explain how you're going to do a kickflip down 10 stairs there's just a feeling that you have to feel to then go and do that thing it's a process of like removing that traditional self like there's no explaining and, and like you said before you're like um oh you can't be telling yourself about that turn that's ahead you can't be thinking about the result that's the self being in the picture and and the guys like mm -hmm. what you're explaining with Carmichael there's just this void of self they've figured out how to tap into this place where that traditional self the story that you tell yourself about your experience that's been removed from the the picture and they're just it's Ricky Carmichael having the experience complete immersion without any uh detachment back into like the self world of explain wow i'm winning a race wow this is happening i'm going to be three points yeah. up in the championship gone none of that mm -hmm. exists and that's what you see like i'm a different person when i take the helmet off or oh i lose myself when i ride like uh, so that that is i think what is under <coughs> underneath all of this and so in my like personal experience now for me i get there with jujitsu instantly that's one of the things why I think I think that's why people get addicted to riding. That's why people get addicted to surfing, addicted to sex, addicted to anything is because there's that feeling that you're getting like the self is being taken away. Because like you said before, um, the, the like the suffering that you can have in your life is because you're thinking you're thinking about the past, you're thinking about the future that that's the that's the only place that that can exist. So why do you feel desperate to get to the track and ride? Because that self is forcibly removed. You don't have control over it being there. You can get to that place. When I go to jiu-jitsu, I ain't thinking about shit, dude. For the <clears throat> fucking two hours yeah. that I'm there, yeah. not a thought goes through my head. I'm not me. I don't have a podcast. I don't have fucking a thousand DMs. I don't have fucking threads on vital talking shit. Like I don't have yeah. anything. I've just got an experience mm -hmm. that I'm having. So I think that what, what you're really describing is and and that's what you know curious to see how much you've read into those kind of philosophies and how much that you've you've looked into that because like you're explaining this concept of of non-duality and the thing is is that 
you don't need the motorcycle to get there you don't need a surfboard to get there you don't like that's you can train like you can visibly see like if you look for the ryan hughes that's in your head if you look for the person that you're having a conversation with in your mind they're not there it's just this process yeah. <clears throat> well, that is helping you, know, you get through life yeah i mean who so that's the thing is who's the voice in your head but who's it talking to mm. but who's listening to it mm-hmm. <laughs> you get what i'm saying so when you yep. start thinking about well i'm the voice in my head well okay but who's it talking to are you that mm. but who's listening are you that no that's just telling you how fucking kind of crazy us human beings are and you have to realize that you're not all these things and you're you're the center so again this is why orgasm is so is so uh addictive because Mm -hmm. that one split second push you're gone yep no thoughts no feelings no emotions no nothing you just experience but it's addicting and that's why and that's why everybody chases it but it's so short you know <clears throat> so i would say more of my teaching more of my outlook is more on a tantric way mm. because tantric tantra is scientific it doesn't tell you what to do it gives you a technique of how to do it and so that's the same with me with my teaching i don't tell you what to do i give you a technique of how to do it that's so much mm. deeper anybody anybody can tell you what to do <laughs> fuck that's what most theologies do, tell you what to do. But Tantra gives you a technique of how to do it. And Tantra doesn't have a high or a low. It doesn't have a good or a bad. It doesn't have a God or a devil. Yeah. There's, no, there's no limit on, on Tantra. Tantra is just telling you, and Tantra isn't limiting you. It wants you to use your full, your full, you know, your full mechanism of yourself. So it doesn't deny anything. It just has techniques of how to help you manage your own self. It's a guidebook. It's scientific. It gives techniques. It doesn't Mm. have highs or lows, but this is a different, this is why people think Tantra is all about sex. It's not about sex. Most people that know about tantric sex, they don't know Tantra, the Tantra theology. Yeah. Could you explain Tantra? Like if it doesn't have overview, it, 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 if it doesn't have, like I say, if it doesn't have any, any realms on it, like you have to do this, you have to be like this, you can't do this, you can't be yeah. that way, you can't be a sinner, you can't be a murderer, you can't be a sex guy. Well, you can be all these people if you want, because that's you, that's God living through you, so to speak. But when it doesn't, when it doesn't have a cap on anything, then you can run wild with it, and that's why tantra has over. I don't know how many different sexual positions because there's no cap on it. You can be as creative as you want with it. But then it got a rap that it got a rap that, Oh, Tantra is just sex. No, not fucking at all. It's scientific on how it's like a guidebook, you know? And it's same with, you know, has, is a lot of stuff like Buddhism and that, that whole Eastern uh, theology, that philosophy there. Yeah. And that's kind of, to me, what Buddhism is and all these is almost guidebooks of how to guide yourself, you know, how to manage these dark, places how to manage these greeds how to manage these things not just deny them and suppress them where they become stronger like a lot of religions do just suppress it suppress it suppress it no 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 you better look at it dude you need to look at it straight in its eyes straight in its eyes and if you don't look at it straight in its eyes it's coming back in in about a, a week or two stronger yeah so how are you stronger you know whatever that fear whatever that doubt whatever that loneliness is whatever it is you know you have to yeah. look at it straight in the eyes and 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 become friends with it because it's part of you you know and so, so that's kind of i would say i go down more go down more that road of yeah. it because it doesn't fall into the religion that doesn't fall into the religion category whatsoever everything else does but tantra doesn't yeah so yeah no i'm totally with and, you and with i like that it because i like it because it's i like it because it's it's cut and dry it's logic mm. You know what I mean? There's no fluff on it. There's no fucking stories. There's no fairy tales to it. There's no, there's no master. There's no, there's no, uh, uh, Messiah. Mm. It's amazing because most people get stuck with the Messiah. They can't Mm. get past it or they're trying to live up to the Messiah and they always fall short because you're never going to live up to your Messiah. Mm. You're always going to, you know, you're never going to. So you're going to feel less than you're going to feel guilty. You're going to feel unfulfilled. Oh, I'm a sinner. I'm weak. I'm weak. Cause you're never living up to what you're putting your Messiah at. But mm. if you take that Messiah out, you'll be able to get past that because you're, you're, you're not having any limitations. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I just, you know, I think that's kind of where people kind of get lost a little bit is that they're so stuck on this one name of this Messiah and 
pulled it up at such a trophy that they're always feeling limited and less than because they're never going to live up to it ever, ever, yeah. ever. And that's what I like. Cause I don't want to follow anybody, dude. I don't want to mm-hmm. follow anybody. I want to make my own mistakes. I want to go down my own wrong paths. I don't want to follow a single soul because if I go wrong following somebody, I'd never, I'd never be able to live it down. Mm. I would never be able to forgive myself. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. I took someone else's fucking advice. Someone else's advice. Somebody that's never even walked two foot in my shoes. Yeah. And I took their advice and I went the wrong way. You yeah. idiot. I didn't, shouldn't have listened to my guru, which is me. My intuition. The guy that's walked in every step of my shoes from day one. He knows yeah. me better than anybody. Yeah. Just like when I got attacked by those damn dogs, you know? I got attacked by two dogs and they put seven holes in me, stitches. And everybody's like, did you go get stitches? I said, nah. Nah, I didn't even clean it. They're like, what? I go, nah, I talked to my guru. I'm like, well, what did you say? I asked him. I said, my guru has been there, you know, from every accident, every bad thing. And he's had the best advice for me. And he's never, ever, ever let me down. They're like, dude, what's his name? Can I get his number? I said, it's me, man. It's me. Just like it's you. You know yourself better than anybody on earth. So why are you doubting yourself? Why are you denying yourself? Why are you, why are you listening to somebody else that has nobody knows nothing about you? Mm. You know what I'm saying? That's what blows me away is nobody has the honor of self. The honor of being a human being. The most magnif- myth- magnificent thing in the world. I sound like Mike Tyson right now. Um, <laughs> you know, thing in the world. <laughs> and and uh, But they're denying it. They're not yeah. taking responsibility of it. And that's where I think people are going lost because they're always trying to put it on somebody else or put the responsibility on somebody else of nowadays. Don't offend me. Don't Mm -hmm. say anything to me. Don't I'm putting the responsibility on you not to offend me now because I'm so fucking weak that I can't take the strength to not allow anybody to offend me. Mm -hmm. That's where the the world went wrong. If they were putting all the responsibility on everybody else not to offend us, but we're not taking this, the, the strides to make ourselves responsible, strong enough to not be offended. Mm. And when you don't put a label on yourself, you can never be offended. Yeah, that's a good point. Right? You, you can't. If I don't call myself white, I was just born that way. I don't, I'm, I'm not, you know? Yeah. If I don't call myself an American, I was just born there. You mm. know what I'm saying? You know, if I, if I don't call it a male, you know, all these different things, you know, or religion or this or this. It, the more labels you have, the more you're going to be offended. Mm. Well, you got to think too that to me, th- you know? things are, things are, um, things, I think we take for granted the fact that things exist in more of a state than they do. So let's take that microphone that's in your face, right? So we can comfortably yeah. say <laughs> right now that that's a microphone, but let's, let's take one chord away from that. That's not a microphone anymore. That's the chord. It's, 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 it's fucking, it doesn't work yeah. because I've taken one thing away from it. So it's gone from being a microphone, a thing that I can label. I cut one fucking cord. Now it's just a, what? It's a piece of metal. There's a bunch of shit stuck together on it. And I think that us um, ourselves uh, are like that in a way, you know, like we, we put these like crazy labels on ourselves. We belong to this. We belong to this. And it's like, at what point do you stop being American? Are you always an American because you live there? Or like Chad Reed, is Chad Reed still an Australian? Like he's lived in, in America now for longer than he's lived in Australia. And he probably will never live in Australia again. Is he an Australian? It's, you, you're so right, man. There, mm. and there are these labels that you put on. Yeah. When does a thing, if I've got all of the parts for a car, and it's all put together, and then I slowly start pulling that, like there's no car. There's a collection of parts yeah. that make a thing that we to call a car. car. There's no carness. There's no there's no property that is uh, that that you go like okay at this point I'm putting carness in these things to make it a car. You start pulling it away. You start pulling wheels off it, and then you go to the door, and then you're like okay so we've now got this door off this thing. It's a complete door. When does this thing not become a door? If I slowly start to take things away from it and you can think of like yourself Mm -hmm. as that kind of person, like, what is this? What is this self? Mm -hmm. If I take away these identifications, if I take away these thoughts, what am I then? Am I Jace anymore? Like at what point do I strip away some ideas and some like clinging to certain concepts and ideas to what am I not even Jace, but I would still be here sitting in this chair, having this experience. Mm-hmm. 
No, that's exactly right. As I've heard that thing too. It's like you have a car and you take the door off. Is this a car? No, yeah. it's a door. Is this this? No, it's this. So it's just like you, you know, hey, what, what do you do for a job? Well, that's, oh, you're a construction. Oh, so you're a construction worker. No, I'm not a construction worker. You know, so there's different parts, just persona. Oh, you're an angry person. No, I'm not an angry yeah, person. Yeah, oh, yeah. you're loving. Well, no, you know, there's so many different parts of you that yeah. if, you, if you identified one part of them, it's like, just like anybody, you know, say, like, okay, hey, that guy, uh, he got accused of rape or whatever, but he didn't do it. He's a rapist. No, he's not. That was just one thing of him. There's mm. many different parts of him. And just because he, that one part of him was, was uh, you, you can deny that part, doesn't mean that's him. You know what mm. I mean? There's so many different parts of us and what we always want to say, oh, he's not a good guy or he's this or he's that or, or again, I'm a motocrosser. Mm. That's it? <laughs> no, there's so many different parts of that. So again, you took that motocross away. Now, who are you? And mm. that's my whole thing with everybody. You know, mm. oh, I want to get, I want to be rich. Okay, now what? You know, uh, once, uh, once you get done with riding motocross, well then now, who are you? That's mm. why I tell everybody, I go, the d toughest day is coming. It's not motocross. Oh, motocross is so tough. I said, no, no, no. I go, wait till you quit. Wait mm. till you quit, son. Then you'll see what tough is, you know, because every athlete dies twice. They die when they say they're done and they die when they die. And so mm. I said, the day that you quit, maybe not the, not the day, but give it a, give it a good six months. Then you'll see, you mm. know, <laughs> it's the now, who are you? Who are you? Because you, you built up this persona, you built up this personality. And I went through that. When I got done racing, it was like, well, now who am I? Especially when I broke my back and I could never kind of race again or kind of be the guy I wanted to be. It was like, who am I? Mm. I built this persona. I built this ego. I built this whole thing of rhino. But now I can't even be a rhino. Mm. And so who am I? You know, so that was kind of a whole thing of, of, of finding, just like you're saying, you know, taking a part of the car off. Mm. Like, is this a car? No. That was just, that was just my persona, you know? And have you, so, I, yeah, so it's right. And that, that, and that's the thing with so many people, they, they want, they have to be involved in something. They have to be part of something because most people don't have that rebellious side. They don't have that rebel side. They don't have that, that, um, you know, that side that wants to, you know, uh, you know, wants to challenge, I guess. Right. Yeah. Things. So they get stuck in, they, 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 they find these groups and they get in these groups, these religions, these groups, these teams, this whatever. And then you start to become that conscious thinking. If yeah. whatever that group is, that, that conscious thinking, that collective thinking in that group is, you're going to start thinking like them. Yeah. So then you become like this collective thought, this collective, uh, thought pattern, this collective yeah. group. You're yeah. becoming like them. Now you're becoming fake. Now you're becoming a duplicate. Now, after you become a duplicate, you're going to start finding all your monotonous, all your unfulfillments, all your, you know, unhappiness, all your anxieties, everything, because you're fake. Mm. You know, nature only makes do na nature only makes one of a kind. They never doesn't make duplicates. Yeah. Nature only makes masterpieces, never makes duplicates. And everybody's trying to be a duplicate. And they have a problem with me being a masterpiece by being just unique, by yeah. just being myself. Because when you yeah. were born, you're born as a blank screen of a, a blank piece of paper. Here came your mom. Here came your dad. Here come your grandpa, your grandma, your society, your religion, your friends, your social media. Fuck, who are you? Oh my God, you're ugly now because you're a duplicate. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's yeah. what happens to us. And none, none, of a, none of us is unique anymore. We've lost mm. that. And any... And again, like say, nature only makes one of a kinds. You'll mm. never find a leaf, a rock, a snowflake, a snowflake. an animal, yeah. a fucking tree, and anything the same. Never. Ever. But all us human beings want to be the same. Mm. Nature is so imperfect, it's perfect. Yeah. Society tries to be so perfect, it's imperfect. Yeah. Right? And so, you know, that's the way I look at it. It's like, you know, the tr a tree, let's say the tree is a mind right? The whole tree is the mind and every leaf, every leaf is different. So every leaf is a human being. And since every leaf is different, meaning we all think the same, we all have the same things. I didn't go to Australia and you guys have 13 emotions and Americans only have eight. Mm. Does that make sense? We yep. all have the same thought patterns. We all have the same fears, the same worries, the same this. So my way is the thinking is like the tree is the mind. Every leaf is a, is a, is a, is an, is an individual, but every leaf is different. So every individual is different by getting 
hung up on little things. You might get more hung up on something that makes you more angry. I yeah. might get hung up on something that makes me more sexual. Someone else might get hung up on something that makes them more depressed. But we all think the same. We mm. all have. We all think the same. We just get hung up in different parts, and that's kind of my way of looking at a tree and just going, "Well, we're all different because every leaf is different." So we mm. need to. We need to accept that. We need to accept that we're different and allow that to be different. And then that spark, that happiness will come out of you. You're not covering yourself up, trying to fit in with what you think is cool and what you think everybody wants you to be. Right. And have you, have you had, you know, um, that's, that's my perspective. Oh, I fucking love it. Have you had any experiences when you retired and you're kind of going through this phase of like figuring out who you are post racing and post <laughs> everything that's that happened in your life did you have any like ego death type experiences or any of those that like really pulled away um a lot of the like you said before like the dust like have you had any experiences that have made that shit really clear for you and what was the did you seek that out was it random like how has that process kind of happened for you I would, uh, I'll put my I'll put my finger on three things. <clears throat> um, one, when I broke my back, I was at the track. We're doing we're doing some uh, whoops and stuff, and we're going through it. Boom, 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 boom. And I went through it one time, and the back end got sideways, and time completely stopped. Fucking stopped. Fourth gear wide open on a 450. Time doesn't stop. It stopped and gave me a decision: to chop it or gas it. To chop it or gas it. To turn off my ego or turn my ego on. This is what I get from it. And the swap wasn't so bad, so I said gas it. And right when I said gas it, it felt like something just pulled me off my bike. And I went head first into a jump, and I paralyzed from neck down for a few minutes, and then went paralyzed in the hospital for eight hours, and da 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 So I remembered that to a T, and I always thought that that was life going, okay, <clears throat> are you going to be the same person, or are you going to change? Because I thought at that time I could still be this rhino for 10 more years, you know? But, dude, I was... Yeah. And so that was that clicking point of life going, okay, if you're not going to change yourself, we're going to change you. Mm. And it put the situation happened to me. And I, and I, I knew it was true. I knew things, you know, in the back of my head, but there was my own story. Three years later, I see Larry Brooks at uh, Paula and we're talking da, 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 and he goes, Hey dude, you know what? He goes, I got to tell you, he goes, I was there at that crash when you, when you crashed here. And he goes, that was the ugliest crash I've ever seen in my life. He goes, I just fucking walked away. He goes, I was 100 feet away from you or more, and I felt the ground shake when you hit the ground, when wow. you hit the jump. And he goes, but, and I go, really? And he goes, but the f weird thing is, dude, he goes, he goes, it looked like something just pulled you off your bike. And I fucking just stopped in my tracks. I'm like, wow. what? He goes, dude, it looked like something just pulled you off your bike. And right, I almost, I almost, I almost started crying. It was just like, because what no I shit. felt and what I experienced and what I thought was true, somebody else, three years later, told me the same thing. And it was like, whoa. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that was one thing. <clears throat> Another thing, uh, when I was married, you know, this and this and this. Sorry, Ronnie, uh, two, two secs. I just want to, um, it's just yeah. the video's frozen. Yeah. I'm just, just going to. When that just, happened. Oh, sorry. I'm just going to part text. of me died. But the part of me that died was the part I was always trying to deny, trying to get away from me. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so that was, that was another kind of dust clearer because I was so hung up on this guy or this guy that I was, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't want to get in it deep because I don't want to yeah. be too personal. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. No, but that, this guy, and it just seemed like when that broke away, this, a, le a little layer of dust went away also. Yeah. Okay. So that was the thing, and, 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 and maybe to, to look at, just to not be so self-centered, so egotistical, so yeah. me. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because being an athlete, being a professional motocrosser, it's so easy to get in that position. Now my birthday, the night of my birthday, I had one of the worst nights of my entire life. I don't know what happened. I went to bed, and it's just I, all this anxiety, this fear, this this apprehension of the future and what I've taken on there and da 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 it just started to hit me. I had to get out of bed five times. It's this has never happened. I'm a like you know yeah. uh, this, this girl I this girl I see, she's like, what 
I love about you is you can relax better than anybody. But mm-hmm. I could not sleep. And I back and forth and up and down. The next day, I was kind of sad too. It was a weird thing. I couldn't put my finger on. Then Tuesday, then, then Tuesday rolled around. Boom. It's just like I see, it's like almost I see a different world right now because I turned mm-hmm. 48. And all my, all my kind of sign stars, things, and this and this, is this is the most powerful time in my life right now. Really? And this will not ever happen for another 16 years in my life. This time. This is where I'm at the sharpest, strongest, most focused, most determined. Mo- the, the, yeah, the pinpoint of my life is right now. Yeah. And I felt, it, I felt the fucking change, dude. I felt the fucking change. And I can't deny it. And those are the things that I see that kind of, uh, kind of stripped away a little bit of my ego. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you know, when my dad died, I think that it, it built a lot of, uh, it, it, it put a lot of, uh, <clears throat> Uh, a lot of, uh, mm. like, I guess not anger. Yeah. A lot of anger in me, a little bit of anger mm. in me, a lot of, um, feeling like I was, um, you know, you almost not like an orphan, but just, um, abandoned. Mm. You get what I'm saying? Not that yep. he abandoned me. He just died, but you can't help but being 21 years old and not dealing with things and feeling. So I had to get rid of, I had to go get rid of a lot of things that get built up by my dad dying that yeah. I never dealt with because I was in the middle of the season, middle of my career. Mm. You know, I won the I won my first supercross a week after he died. So, you know, it's like I never really dealt with it. So I, I dealt with that. And then I think that was a kind of a big stripping of stuff as, as I'm starting to get older. So yeah. to answer that question, those are the things that I see. Yeah, man. Thanks for sharing that too. I know that is pretty personal. I can't. So, um, yeah, we're back. Sorry about that, dude. No stress, man. We'll uh, we'll, we'll we'll bash out this last half hour, dude. I feel like I could talk to you forever. <clears throat> yeah, probably could. We have well, that's the same thing when you have the same mindset, the same energy that they connect. You know, they 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 almost work together. You know, you don't have to try. Yeah, and that that's and that's relationship and stuff like that. If you're if you have to try to make this work, if you have to struggle to make this work, then it's not going to work. Yeah, you know, you're just wasting your time. It just, you're just, you're just creating a very expensive, um, you know, I guess love affair. If, if that, I don't know yeah. how to explain it, but that's the thing is too many people get into, into relationship because of the attachment of, I don't want to be lonely anymore. So I'm going to have to find somebody They find somebody. Mm. Then the attachment of uh, that, I am not going to allow anybody to have you. You are mine. I own you attachment to that. And then that's where the problem starts Yeah, because you're trying to own somebody. You try to own somebody, then you try to change them to what you think they should be, and then they they turn out they turn into something that they're not, and then that's when they start having issues with themselves. <clears throat> You're the only person in front of them, so they point fingers at you. You do this, you don't do that, and da da da, da. and then they're cause that create that problem, right? Yeah. And that's with the relationship is that way. Instead of realizing that it takes two banks to make a river flow, your river is your marriage, your relationship. One side of the bank is you and the other side of the bank is the other person mm. and you guys have to work together and you can't be pointing fingers at each other because what happened is you guys both changed. <clears throat> you guys have lost yourself. <clears throat> you changed into what that other person thought they wanted of you and you did. Now that other person doesn't really want you because you changed into somebody that you're not. Mm. You get what I'm saying? And we have that because we do it out of fear. We do it out of controlling. We do it out of ownership. We do it out of lack of understanding we do it out of lack of love we don't know what love is you know what i'm saying and because we're, we're told so that that's uneducated what we it's yeah we're so uneducated with the things that we do of having kids and getting married and having relationships because we're just told that we should do it yeah. but we're not told why we're not we're not given the other side of it you know my daughter uh co- uh is a nanny for paul check which is oh yeah pretty cool yeah yeah <laughs> so yeah that's pretty cool huh be, be at Paul Check's place every day so just at the at a university and she baby gets these, these kids and stuff like that and um and she's like dad I, I don't know if I want kids when I get older now I say I experience it it is a shitload of work yeah and now you know me I, I'm, I'm single so <clears throat> I can experience with other people and I get some women that are older that don't have kids and then I've had women the same age that have had kids and I'm like holy shit man kids take about 10 years out of you mm. body wise and face wise because of how much just how tough they are you get what I'm saying I mean it's very dragging so uh, you know just just saying that but you know people aren't realizing what comes with that 
And yeah. you have to, I think you need to see the other side of it too. You know, especially with, with a relationship, everybody wants to get in there and know, oh my God, I'm going to be so happy. I have the house, the white picket fence, the husband, the how, da, 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 da. But you're not seeing the other side of it that nobody's showing you. And that's where I think that people need to be seen. So you go, oh, okay, hold on. Maybe I need to make a different decision instead of just jumping in into something because what you have to unwind is much long, deeper than what you wound up hmm. after a relationship. Trust yeah. me. Trust me. I did 24 years with one woman. And, uh, and so unwinding it, not my thing wasn't financial or this and that. You know, my thing unwinding it was internal. Mm. And we are great friends. We are great friends. We still tell, tell each other we love each other, you know? Great friends. Have so much respect for each other. So it's not like we're fighting, but the unwinding, <clears throat> the unwinding was in myself, mm. you know? So. I, I feel like that. Um, and then. <clears throat> in terms of like e every relationship that I've come out of, like I've had a few serious relationships. And um, the last one that I, I ended up breaking up with my now ex in like. September October 2019 and like man I mm -hmm. I knew coming out of that one we were together for a few years and doing the house like the whole deal and I knew coming out of that one that it was my fault like just the person that I was like there was you know there, it is two banks and there was two um there's two people that there's two selves that have to work together and like I just wasn't right yeah. with myself and I knew that dude like and I've spent so for the last, I mean, and COVID honestly was like a blessing as well. Like having to do 2020, like I just did it alone. I went, I got a little apartment and a fucking dog, a mattress on the floor. And like, I just did it alone. I, I tried to take, uh, all of the external things away. And, and like when you just said unwind, it kind of makes that, that hits for me, you know, like, cause I sort of stripped everything away from from me to really find out what was under all of the things, what was under all the attachments, what was underneath all the ideas. Like yeah. what was the thing that exists constantly when there's so many things that come yeah. and go and change and moods and desires and cravings and hunger and tired, sadness, ha that all those things are in, they're out, they're in, they're out, they come, they go. But underneath that, there has to be a me there somewhere. And it's like, mm -hmm. The, to describe the unwinding thing like I think that yeah that does hit and it was one of the things I wanted to ask you like the way that you live now you're out in the mountains you got no wi-fi you got none of that shit is there like a big process <laughs> uh, of I get I have some wi-fi all right fair enough but Good. you know like yeah, no, you, sorry, you sorry, are yeah. you are on your you are on your own though you know what i mean like you're you're sort of out there for the majority of the time like doing your own thing and there's like quiet that you don't have the distractions you don't have the like we just take noise for granted even like i don't know if have you ever done like float tanks and stuff like that but like mm -hmm. have you ever been in a float yeah. tank yeah yep, yep, yeah yep, yeah i have I have. but like so the just the fucking sound of your own breathing can be like a rock concert when you're void of all mm -hmm. other so like but that sound of breathing we're making that constantly all day you don't even hear it so it's like there's so much shit layered on top of of like who we are that you end up living in this like this ether of fucking noise and all these vibrations and sounds and distractions and conversations and <clears throat> other selves and emotions and dealing with other people's emotions and so for a guy like you that spends a lot of time away in quiet like there's got to be some serious insight there that you can find. Yeah. You know, that, that's the thing is most people are just bombarded by Wi-Fi, by bar bombarded by the 5g bombarded by, you know, smart stuff like smart TVs and all this bombarded by other people's energies, negativities, yeah. all yeah. these different things bombarded by noise, bombarded yeah. by pollution, break dust. You know, people don't realize that nobody talks about break dust. Okay. I read a study on break dust. Break dust is one of the most, polluting factors out there because it's carbon fiber and it and it from every street freeway it will float three miles out so anybody is by a freeway or a heavy place is just getting these carbon fiber dust in their lungs and all these different things so you know that that that's the thing is getting away from that the other weekend i was out at my place um had a little birthday and one of my older friends came you know doug he's like 75 years old he came out there <clears throat> and we're walking around my trails and we stopped and i said hey doug I go, listen. And he started listening. He's like, oh my God. 
He's like, I haven't heard this quiet, this much quietness in, in, in a long time. He's like, I forget what it's like. And I go, listen, you can almost hear a cricket fart, you know, joking with him. And then we started talking a little bit. And I say, Hey, I go, I go, <clears throat> excuse me. I go pay attention to how you're talking right now. Mm. And he goes, I'm whispering. He goes, I'm whispering. Exactly. You're whispering. Cause it's so quiet out there. You almost feel like you have to whisper. Mm. It's strange. It's yeah. a strange thing. We're on top of a mountain on top of there. You know, I have neighbors, but they're 10, 20 acre parcels. They're out. And it felt like we had to whisper because it was so quiet, mm. you know? So mm-hmm. that there is massive because we're getting so polluted by noise. You always have to have noise. You always have to have somebody around you. You always have to have distraction. You always have mm-hmm. to have, you know, this, this compadre. You always have to have this group. You always have to have this click. You always have to have this, this, you know what I'm saying? And I don't have a group. I don't have a click. I don't have a, <clears throat> you know, like this around me. I don't care to, you know, I have visit. I have visitors that come. I have, you know, I have women that come here every once in a while here and there, you know? So, uh, I got that going, but, uh, I don't, I just don't feel like I need to be around that many people. I don't feel like I need to be around, uh, things that suck my energy. I don't think I need to be around things that challenge my and challenge my intelligence or challenge my way. Uh, I don't want to be around people that are, are just following blindly this, Mm. this, these, these, these crooks that we follow. I don't want to be, I don't want to associate with it. You know, like I said before, why should I care about you? It's not my fucking responsibility, man. It's not. I got enough things to, to, to pay attention to and to be responsible for and to care for. I don't have to do it for everybody. And so I don't choose to be around there. And when you don't do that, then you can allow yourself to be back to our conversation, to have that freedom because you have simplicity and yeah, creativity and then that creates happiness. And when you create happiness, you're not looking for anything to fill that void. Mm. You know what I mean? Do I get lonely out there? Yeah, I get lonely. Do I, do I, you know, do I sometimes have a little fear of this road that I'm going down. Of course I do. I'm a human being. I'm Mm. not a rock. I'm a human being. I have that. I'm a very, 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 very sensitive person when I give my heart to somebody or I give Mm. my heart to something. If I give my heart to something or somebody, I'm very sensitive. And this is why motocross, I'm very sensitive about it because I've given my heart to it. I've given my life to it. So I'm going to, I'm going to stick up to it and I'm going to protect it anytime I can. And if anybody wants to challenge me, I'll fucking fight them until I break them in pieces. Does that make sense? So same thing with a relationship is that I'm very sensitive with a woman in that way because I've given my heart to you. I don't do that to everybody. I don't do that. You know, Mm -hmm. I don't give myself to anybody. You know, I give myself to my, what I do, my passion. And that was another conversation I was having with another woman the other day. <clears throat> she was talking about, you know, oh, you're, you have been how much you're so passionate about this and so passionate about that. I'm like, well, I don't know. I don't know if it's passion or I don't know if it's obsession. Mm. What I think is it, <clears throat> what it is, it's being present. Yeah. Being present. So what I do, I have an ability to be present with. So it looks like it's absolute obsession it looks like it's absolute focus, you know, this and that, but it's just absolutely being present. Even yeah. when I'm doing something outside working, someone will talk to me and I'll be in something and I'll find myself completely not listening to what they're saying. Cause I'm so present in what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And yeah. so I think passion and I think obsession can be, can be miscued for someone being completely present in what they're doing. Mm. Right. Same with someone eating food. If you're completely present eating food, you can be like, dude, has that guy not eaten for a while? Mm. You know? <laughs> and, and, and that's the thing is learning how to be more present. How do you learn to be more present? By learning how to feel. Well, <clears throat> how do I learn how to feel? When you walk out of your house, take your time and, 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 and <clears throat> you know, feel every step that your foot's going to be hitting the ground. You know, anticipate your heel hitting the ground. And feel your foot, every mm. walk, every step. When you eat, close your eyes, turn your phone off, turn that stuff, and taste your food. Feel your food. Feel the texture of it. You'll be amazed at how much more flavor comes out of it. You'll be mm. amazed when you walk slow and put your attention in your feet, what kind of smells you smell and what kind of sounds you hear. When you're taking a shower, feel that shower. And when you're in bed, feel that pillow in that bed when you're by yourself try to see if you're actually comfortable in your own skin Mm. think about it 
You know, I feel that this soul has taken this, this, this human being, but it hasn't, it hasn't accepted taking this in. It's almost like a jail for it. You know what I'm saying? And mm. so it's not ever comfortable in its own skin. Cause why is humanity so restless? Why is humanity so, you know, just, just at unease mm. for some reason. So I don't know. I just been kind of thinking about this. Cause I get a lot of time by myself and I'm like, man, have I, am I, am I really comfortable in my own skin? I had to really think about it. You know what I mean? And yeah. what would that would be? And it's just whole thought process came up of like about the soul and of this, you know, and yeah. you know, maybe it is finally accepting that I'm comfortable in my own skin because yeah. anybody that has anxiety, anybody that wants to be something different, anybody that has disorders, well, they're not comfortable in their own skin. Yeah. Right. Or so, there's like so a longing maybe, in some capacity. Maybe, maybe pondering on it. Yeah. Yeah. Or there's like mm -hmm. a longing in some capacity to change the current <clears throat> experience. Yeah. Yeah. Like whatever you yeah, are currently. Become. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like whatever you are, um, you're, you're seeking something like you're, you're, uh, trying to, uh, to become something because whatever you're doing in the present moment isn't enough. If you're alone and you're uncomfortable with being alone, then you're trying to change that present moment. You want to bring somebody else into that. And, and you know, it's, you've spoken about it a bunch, um, today. It's just like, constantly filling that void and that's why i think um you know like the that float tank experience for example it's it's i think it's powerful for your psyche to go into a, a tank like that you've got no feeling you've got um you've got no light you've got no sound there's nothing going on and you can hear the your just your breath just breathing is like a fucking concert it's so loud it can be mm -hmm. like almost like <clears throat> scarily loud it's not like that tank is making your breathing any louder it's just your awareness is like so engulfed in in that there's nothing else you've like stripped away so we are like in daily life you're living in this place of just like phenomenal input from the outside world that is it's just like a fucking barrage on the senses and then what you're um, mm. consciousness is doing is trying to amalgamate all of these senses at different times like light hits your eyes faster than the sound from the blink uh, from the click of my fingers but your consciousness is like amalgamating those two things so that it's the same it's the same thing you know so it's like there's yeah. just this fucking sensory overload on us constantly and as soon as you step outside of that like when you go up into the mountains into your place and there's nobody else there and there's no sound around when you like step outside of that it's almost like a, a harrowing experience because for most people's life dude like and then you add in the fucking the phones and the notifications and the texts mm -hmm. and the the all of that that shit it's like we are just being fucking inundated and what happens is you just become used to living in that place you just become used to living in that heightened mode where there's so much shit coming at you constantly that it just feels normal and then when you go into isolation it's a very scary experience because all of a sudden you've removed all of that um all of that stimulus but it feels louder than being out there with all the shit coming at you yeah i mean it's 100 percent. they've done things like that where people go into complete sound you know soundless rooms and they almost go insane. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because nobody is, has been, has been there before. So it's the same thing as like when I go out there and when I come back in town now, I get restless. I get, I get any mm -hmm. kind of a little bit uneasy because I'm taking on all these people's energies. There's just chaos. There's people going everywhere, you know, people wearing all these, they're, you know, just whatever. <clears throat> so, you know, people still following these, these, these ways that shouldn't be being followed. So it just makes me kind of, kind of irritable if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Cause I got so used to being, kind of my own thing, you know, yeah. it's my, it's my own energy out there. So it's, it's beautiful. Um, you know, so that's the thing is just getting completely sensory overload and, and that's where the problem can occur. And also having too much overload with the extraordinary, yeah. because once you look at the extraordinary and put it down, then you've dealt with the ordinary, yeah. you're going to pick up the extraordinary again, because this yeah. extraordinary is changing every second. The yeah. ordinary is the same. And that's why everybody doesn't even look at the ordinary anymore. They don't even look at the stars. At my place, it's amazing. You see so many stars. I was going to ask you it's if you can see the, the stars out there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The big, I see so, it's unbelievable. 
Yeah. yeah. So, um, so that's another thing, but you know, we have to, we have to detox ourselves from that. We have to detox ourselves. We can't just, you can't just keep piling this stuff up of all this overload of all this electronical of all this, you know, social media stuff and things like that. Also what we eat, what we breathe, what we drink, you know, all the stuff they're spraying in the air. There has to be something you're doing detoxing and there has yeah. to be something that you're doing to, to kind of biohack the system, you know, to wake up sleeping DNA, to wake up sleeping, you know, dormant DNA that's in us that yeah. we can bring out, that we can make alive again from, to me, what has been our, our lifestyle has put it to sleep. Okay. Yeah. What the, what they're spraying on us, this and that's put to sleep. So you can wake it back up from ice baths and saunas. So I ask that I sauna an ice bath twice a day, yeah. twice a day. And I probably do two, two times to you know, two, uh, a sauna, ice bath, sauna, ice bath, or ice bath, sauna, you know, back and forth. But yeah. I do it twice a day. I, I imagine I do it more than anybody in the world, but most people just do ice and most people just do heat. But when you do both, that is the first medicine of humanity is hydrotherapy. And that is my absolute goal right now is to make a hydrotherapy resort out at my place so I can bring people out there and get them to really, really feel the difference of hot and cold because that is the game changer. Hot and yeah. cold is a game changer. I've healed my femur in four months. I broke, I healed a foot that was supposed to have surgery without having surgery. I healed seven puncture wounds from dogs in, in two days, you know, and, and, uh, people come to me and they're so, so much in pain. I've broken 26 bones. I've had 24 surgeries. I have four plates, three rods, 26 screws in my body. You know, these things I can go on forever <clears throat> and I don't have any pain in my body. And it's because of my protocol that I do the hot and cold, the hot and cold, because the hot takes the blood and brings it to the surface. And it takes out the infrared takes out all the inflammation that's been built up in your body from what you do and what you eat and what you think. It, t it balances your hormones. It's so, uh, so uh, it soothes your emotional pattern. Mm. It cleanses your blood. It makes your bones stronger. It clean, it heals, cuts bruises and, and, uh, things like that quicker, uh, brings energy to you. Um, you know, there, there's so many things that it does cause it penetrates you six inches deep, uh, mm. far infrared does. So it's the deepest heat you can get into you. Then you get into an ice bath and it's like rebooting your phone. Boom. It's a shock to you. You get mm. what I'm saying? So when you can do that by getting something to penetrate you so deep with heat that detoxes you so deeply and then get into something with ice that shocks the system and gets that blood to flow so quickly that it, mm. that it excites the lymphatic system, well, now your immune system, your strength, your power, your clarity, it takes out heavy metals, it takes out plastic residue in you. And this is why, I mean, hopefully when you see me talk, I may maybe... I talk a little bit more clear, a little bit more sharp, a little bit more quick than some because there's not a bunch of fucking fog in my head. There's not a bunch of buildup and residue in there because of my, my surroundings. I detox this shit every day. And if you're an athlete and you don't ice bath and sauna every day, then you're not too, you're not too focused on being in recovering. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because that's a whole new level of stuff. Whole new mm -hmm. level. I just got Noah and a couple other guys this uh, sauna. And then I asked them, hey, how was it? They're like, I go ask them. I say, oh, were you sore? Like, ah, I'm a little sore. I go, but how did you sleep? And they're like, oh my God, I slept mm. like a baby. I've never slept like that in my life. I said, welcome to the sauna world, baby. Mm. So this, this is a game man. you got to detox yourself. You can't be, can't be taking in all this stuff and not getting out. You can't yeah. keep filling your refrigerator up and not let getting and not eating the food. Yeah. You know what I mean? You can't keep filling your gas tank up and not running the motorcycle. And that's what's happening to us is that we're, we're compiling all this stuff. We're on 20 different, you know, social media platforms. And that's why I only do use one Instagram done, done. That's all I do. I Instagram, I text, I email, I phone call done. Yeah. I don't, I don't search the webs. I don't do none of that shit. It's boring to me. So those things is, is, is detoxing yourself, getting out in nature, getting out into the mountains, getting out into trails and walking, hiking, running. You know mm. what I'm saying? Watching the sunrise, watching the sunset. When have you watched the sunrise and sunset in the same day? Mm. Going at night and looking at the stars. You know? Actually listening to those birds in the morning. Those are the things, man. Those are the things that detox you. Those are mm. the things that bring you back to life. 
you know, mm. eating a wide range of food, not just one way. Oh, I'm a vegan. I'm a paleo. I'm a this. No, fuck. You got to eat every spoke of that wheel. You mm. have to eat meats. You have to eat fruits, vegetables, nuts, this, that, because anything that you eat consistently one way, you're going to, you're going to, uh, have an imbalance to it. You're going to become immune to it. If you eat eggs too much, you're going to get immunity to it. Right. Or not mm. immunity. You're going to have a, a, um, an, an imbalance you build up like to a it, tolerance to it sense. sort of thing. Well, not a tolerance, an intolerance. You're going to have an intolerance to it, but yeah. you're going to get, you're going to, it's going to start affecting you if eating the same foods because you only get those certain nutrients, those certain vitamins, those certain minerals. To me, this is my way, is eating the full spectrum of it. Mm. Full spectrum. And then I don't, I don't, then I don't, um, you know, pigeonhole myself into saying that I'm a vegan or I'm a this and I'm a that. Now I'm stuck. But fuck, man, I want a hamburger. But I told mm. the whole world and posted to the whole world that I'm a vegan. And now I can't have a hamburger. Oh, shit. <laughs> right? Yeah, so, no, 100%. I, you know, that, that's the thing. So is, is, is making sure, making sure you go to sleep by 10 o'clock, making sure you're up by 6. Yeah, some people have to wake up earlier, but at least be up by 6. You know mm. what I mean? Go to bed by 10. You, that, that's when, you know, because your body works on, your, bi- your body's on a circadian rhythm. Mm. A circadian rhythm. We are light beings. You know, we're yeah. light beings. We go to bed when the sun goes down. We we come up when the sun comes up, and we're on a circadian rhythm. And a circadian rhythm is a twelve-hour period. So if you're eating past twelve hours, if you're not going to sleep in those times, then you 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 start to cut into your recovery time. Yeah. You're digesting food when you should be not be digesting food. You're still up when you should be asleep. Lights are still on when you should be. You know yeah. when it should be dark. My, my room is completely dark. You can't even fucking see. Yeah. But because any light will wake you up. So these little things, these little things, making sure you wake up in the morning and you have your glass of water, some, you know, your superfoods or lemon juice or whatever. You just came from a fast. So you're breaking a fast breakfast, break mm. fast. So break your fast with something good. So my first thing is a big, you know, thing of rhino power with carb fuel. And I have soup, uh, spirulina and maca, oh, yeah. da, 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 da. Yeah. all these things I put in. And yeah. that's a, and that's the first thing I put in my body, you know, moringa, spirulina, beet juice, uh, uh, goji powder. You know, I got, dude, I got a fucking arsenal of stuff, but that's the first thing I put in my body every morning because I'm breaking a fast. So I want to put the, the best nutrients I can in it. Yeah. Does that make sense? You know, instead of just going out the, sh- out the house with a fucking ego and a, and a cup of coffee. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, no wonder you're lethargic all day. No wonder you're chasing that coffee all day. <clears throat> no wonder you're ir- irritable all day. No wonder you didn't have any time for anybody all day. But no Ryan, wonder you weren't use patient. This, what, you're, what you're explaining to me takes hard work and effort, Ryan. This takes commitment. This uh, takes dedication. Uh, what, how do I do this without having to fucking be a savage like you? <clears throat> People don't want it. Yeah. I don't have that. I don't have that answer. People, people don't fucking well, want it. Yeah, I don't have that answer. But no, they don't want it because it, it. They're looking for everybody for them to do it themselves. Just like even this. Oh, God did it and the devil did it. You had nothing to do with it. You had nothing to do with it. Okay. So mm. the thing is, is that you know everybody's pointing fingers that you need to help me. You need to do this. You need to do that. And I can't control. I have no answer for people's laziness. I have no answer for people's uh, lethargicness. Mm. Uh, I have no answer for people's unmotivatedness but if you clean all that bullshit out of you now all that lethargicness laziness unproductiveness will probably leave because what's happening is you're you're just you're just at dis-ease you're just at dis-ease you're not feeling good not that you have a dis-ease not that you have a disease you just are at dis-ease not feeling good something Mm. in you so that's going to create this lethargicness that's going to create this anger that's going to create this you know irritableness it's going to create all that right and so that's where the more you can fine tune and clean it up then those things will slowly start to disappear because a lot of times those are hanging on just because your one of your organs are affected or or something else that you're eating is causing you know an irritation to you because every every organ is linked to a an emotion right and every there's a color for every every emotion and organ so that way so that's the only way that i can tell people is that look at least just do 10 minutes 10 minutes something like that and then you're going to start to feel oh my god i slept Mm. good oh i want to sleep again that good you're going to do it again oh man someone noticed that at my my complexion was nice oh i'm going to do it again 
Oh, whoa, man, these pants are kind of getting a little loose on me. Ah, you know what I mean? So you got to create that motivation. You got to create that passion for it by feeling the difference. But if you don't ever feel the difference, you're never going to, you're never going to step over the line, you know? But I have, again, I was born with the ability to know what makes me feel good. Okay. To sort out what makes me feel good and born with an ability to stick with it. Like you could never stick with it again. Mm. Right. I have an ability to find what works for me and what makes me feel good. And then I have an ability to be disciplined with it like nobody else. Yeah. You know, so that that's just things like that. So how to get people to do that? I just think just they got to feel that they got to feel the benefits. And then it then it's addicting, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. very addicting once you feel the benefits. So well, and just how clean you feel. How sh- so well, everybody be more like Ryan Hughes. Dedicate your life to improving. Dedicate your thoughts to uh, positivity. Um, I you mentioned Paul Check. Uh, I think your motocross is Paul Check. Um, I think that you're a guy that is okay with stepping outside the norms. Um, I think you're a guy that inspires a lot of people, um, whether they even know it or or admit it. Um, I think that you're doing a fantastic job for motocross uh, and I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. Um, and once again, thank you so much for um, you just... This, this whole thing happened because I, I messaged you and I was like, let's fucking, let's get this podcast done. And you were like, done, I'll do it like tomorrow. Let's go. Um, and you lit a fire uh, under me and then we've ended up with this this whole thing. So um, you're an asset. Yeah, you, I think uh, you said, do you, hey, <clears throat> yeah, sorry. You said, hey, do you have a computer? I said, uh, no. So then yeah. that drove you to get a studio. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, um, so. But yeah man, you, you're, just a, right. you're just a force, dude. And um, I've really enjoyed it. Hopefully this isn't the last uh, time that, that you'll be on the podcast. I really hope people have taken a lot out, out of it. There's so much more that we could talk about. There's so many more things I could ask. There's so much more I want to know. Um, but we'll wrap it up at this one. We've pretty much done three hours. Um, and yeah on to the next one uh i'm excited for for it when it happens and and yeah once again man just thank thanks so much you're a fucking really good dude yeah well thank you very much you know i i I, you know again it's a pleasure for me to be on your show because the only thing you do is helping me and so i appreciate that getting a message out uh maybe somebody has been able to put a couple things in their pocket maybe some Mm. people throwing a lot of stuff in the trash that's fine with me uh again it's not about being so dedicated. It's not about being so passionate. It's not about being better than somebody, achieving something, having to live up to something. It's finding what the fuck you love. Find what you love. What kind of drink do you like and what makes you feel good in the morning? What about that coffee latte? What makes you feel good then? What about the bed? What about the food? What about the clothes? What about your exercise? Never do anything that doesn't make you feel good just because somebody else is doing it. But take the time. Take the passion. Take the... The, the honor these little things because the little things are what makes sparks in your life. The little things, the big things come every once in a while if they ever do. But everybody thinks they got to have these big things to be happy, these big events to be happy. But these everyday monotonous things are happening every day. And when you can find joy in the monotonous everyday little things, you're going to start creating a spark in your life. But if you're so conditioned, so attached to these big things happening to you, then, then, then you'll find happiness. You're never going to find it. You're only going to find it through the little monotonous things that you do every single day and finding a joy in those. And that creates a spark in yourself again. So that that's kind of my way of living. I don't do anything that that I don't like. I do nothing that I don't love, you know, and I don't, uh, you know, again, I don't I don't pay attention to people that uh, want to bring me down or want to interfere with my message to, you know, the people that actually follow me like that. um, What's that podcast poop, poop, poop show? Pop, pulp, poop, dick <laughs> show? What's that podcast? Don't know what you're talking about. Who's that guy? No, no, never Steve, heard of her. Steve Asshole? Steve Asses? Never heard of her. Steve Asses? <laughs> oh, that guy. Yeah, okay, sorry, that guy. Yeah, I, I blocked his ass today. Boom, <laughs> fuck, get out of me. You know? So anybody that gets on my Instagram and wants to say something or does that, I fucking block him. Boom, get out. I have no time for anybody. Steve Mathis, boom, get the fuck out. Can I use that in the intro now? Boom, get out. Fuck. (laughs)
fuck See, out, get the fuck, out. fuck you. And I'll, and I'll fucking, I'll fucking challenge you anytime that any kind of debate. And I told him, I texted, I said, anytime you want to have a fucking debate, you tell me where, when, and I'll pay my own way. What's the, um, you, what's man. the shit he doesn't agree with you with? Uh, I don't know. Cause I was talking about boots and he says, Oh, you take you, take your neck brace off and your knee braces off too. new too nut job. I'm like, fuck you, dude. You know, just just random shit like, oh, don't wear your knee braces and and, and neck brace because I'm talking about m- boots. I wasn't even talking about boots. I was just showing the soles. And mm. then he put the you know hashtag nut job. So I just sent that hey. accent. I said that's funny coming Ego. from somebody coming from somebody that doesn't ride, never yeah. rides, has a fucking big mouth that doesn't know anything about the sport, is a de- domesticated man, you know. And so anytime that you want to have a debate and fucking. Tell me where, when, and I will pay for my way because I will riddle you. I will nail you to the ground with knowledge of this sport. And, and so, it makes sense. Fuck the guy. I, mean, I don't so have time should. for anybody like that, dude. I don't give yeah, a shit. I agree. Anybody, anybody, wants to, anybody wants to question me? Anybody wants to make fun of what I'm trying to teach people? Fucking blocked. Get out of here. No time for you. Yeah. No, I, I get it. That's how it should be in this world. That's how yeah. it should be in this world. You know? Not, oh, well, well, maybe. Uh-huh. No. Done. Yeah. Black and white, bitches. <laughs> I fucking love <laughs> Hey, I love it, and I love you, Ryan Hughes. Please don't fucking change. Thanks, I don't think that I don't think that um, you're at risk of that, but you're the fucking man, and I really appreciate no. <laughs> you, bro. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind words. I really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. No, I appreciate it, mate. Thank you. Hey, hang on. I just want to take a uh, Instagram sure. video real quick. If you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe. And to listen to the full three-hour podcast, search Gypsy Tales in your favorite podcast platform or click the link in the description below. Gypsy Gang.